So just think, here we are, still alive. I forgot to give you your homework yesterday that you wake up in the morning. You might have, no, the day before I did it. You should have woke up this morning and gone, wow, I can't believe I'm still alive, you know? Because we don't say that because we assume we're permanent, you see? Big mistake. So think now how amazing I'm still alive, which means basically that our karmic kind of petrol tank of non-killing karma, an accumulation of virtuous, non-harming, non-killing karma is still in our petrol tank, which is why we're still alive. So I'd be, am be amazed and delighted. We're still alive. Not wasted. So we're going to conclude I must not waste this life. Because it's precious. Make the most of it. Keep a, keep a sense of urgency. And for this reason, we're sitting here, listening to these ideas about reality, about happiness, suffering, our mind, all of this is coming from the Buddha. To see it as tools to take it on board in our lives. So we can develop our amazing potential. So we can help others. That's the plan. So I think I want to start with the, we just, that's our little motivation. And then we on, add on top of that, we're not seeing anything Tibetan, and add on top of that this idea of taking refuge. So we just think how marvelous we've got a Buddha to rely upon and his good teachings, and we're going to make the most of it. That's our, really, that's our refuge prayer. And then uh, now we're going to, I'd like to do the Heart Sutra, which is on page eight in your little book. We'll say it and we'll talk about it this morning because, of course, emptiness is the, is the basis of Mahamudra. And we'll do the little, a bit more of the Mahamudra session today as well, the meditation. But we'll talk more about emptiness, looking at the different approaches, trying to get it on the earth, trying to get it out of the sky on the earth and bring it into our daily life. So we imagine there's Buddha sitting there. And this is a common way, apparently, he gave his teachings. It, it's at Rajgir. Vulture Peak, I don't know if you've been there, it's an extraordinary little hill up from the city called Rajgir, near Nalanda Monastery, this amazing place that flourished for several centuries. Great Nalanda, as His Holiness Dalai Lama says, we are the Nalanda tradition. All these great yogis, all the marvelous masters from centuries ago, kind of from there, they all carried the knowledge of, in, of Dharma into Tibet, you know. And uh, so there's Nalanda, near the Nalanda Monastery, an amazing place. And Rajgir, and it's a little hill. You walk up, up, up the steps, 20 minutes, little, little spot on the hill, very quiet. Mm. And we taught, apparently taught quite a bit there. And one way the Buddha gave his teachings was like this. He's sitting there completely absorbed in meditation. And in this one, he's absorbed in the meditation on emptiness. So totally the, a non-conceptual level absorbed within the experience of the absence of inherent existence. That's, you know, think like that. So what's happening is, and this is he, he channeled his thoughts into the minds of his two disciples, Shariputra, but, and also 10th level Bodhisattva Avakitesvara in the, in the human aspect. So, so then the words that they say, mostly from Avakitesvara, because Shariputra asks them a question, he answers, and the whole sutra is his answer. It's all Buddhist teachings, apparently. This is a, apparently the way he gave his teachings. So we visualize that we're there. So if you've been there, it's very small. And as you know, in the first lines, it says, you know, there was a great host of bodhisattvas there. And I used to wonder how they all squeezed in because it's quite small, you know. I remember asking Geshe Dagpra, our, our, our lama in the San Francisco Center, and he said, oh, what do you think? He said, they're sitting in the sky. So imagine you're in the sky with all the holy beings, if you like, on the ground, and there's Buddha in meditation. And we say these words, and we imagine. And then we'll, we'll talk a bit about it afterwards. So thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of Vulture's Mountain in Rajagriya, together with the great host community of monks and the great community of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitesvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokitesvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokitesvara said this to the venerable Sharadvati Putra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this 
correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form and form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors and consciousness are empty. Shariputra likewise, <coughs> all phenomena are emptiness without characteristics, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra therefore in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, <coughs> no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no. Wait, I've got to catch up in English here. No odor, no taste, no objective touch, and no phenomenon. There's no I element and so on, up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There's no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there's no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment, also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there's no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it's not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Ta ta ungate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisvaha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitesvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharadvati Putra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitesvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, asuras, and Gandharvas were overjoyed. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. So, okay. So, um, so okay. So, as it says in there, you know, Buddha was absorbed in emptiness, which means he's an absorbed in a non-conceptual state, having a direct cognition of emptiness. You know, the best we can do is hear the words, okay? Not conceptual not a sensory state, this subtler level of mind. So then it starts, when that, start, this, that, that list starts, it begins with, and within emptiness, within emptiness, there is no. So really meaning that for the, this is coming from the perspective of a person, Buddha, in absorbed in emptiness. So from that perspective, they say when you know absorbed in subtle concentration on emptiness, there are no appearances of anything. Because all of the entire universe is, is created conceptually, you see. So when conceptuality ceases, seeing th things cease appearing. We've got to understand this. It's a very abstract concept for us because we have no, we just think in the, the Western scientific view of how the, the world appears. But when we realize it's all due to karmic appearance for a start, everything we see and hear and taste and touch and smell is due to our karma, due to our past actions. We create the world in that sense. But quite literally, it is a product of conceptuality over eons and eons of time. Everything that's existing is coming from the mind. We create cups and toilets and mugs and wars and flowers and, you know, the entire universe is the product of our collective past karma. And the evolution of it is through mind. You've got to understand that. So this whole world is, 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 a, is an object of conceptuality. And then, of course, is the senses, seeing the shapes and the colors and hearing the sounds and the rest of it's conceptual, the description of everything. All of this is really kind of in reinforcing the idea that there's no intrinsic nature of anything. But also enforcing the idea that our minds are utterly connected to what exists, whereas the view we have in the West is you get born, someone plonks you on the planet, and what's out there has nothing to do with you. I mean, it's a, it's a very fascinating idea, utterly different to the Buddha. So the next thing is all this list. It's basically a list of all the phenomena, the, the, the list of how, what exists in these groupings of things that exist 
in, from the Buddhist worldview. Mm. So the first lot is the five aggregates. So Buddha gave it the teaching at some point, I don't know what it's called, where he presented these aggregates, these combination of things. And, he, and it's, it's, the main, it's the way of dividing a person, or secondly, the entire impermanent universe, into five, five little heaps, uh, five components. So from the perspective of the person, form refers to the physical, then feeling and discrimination are two of these crucial states of mind in that category I, mean, I mentioned called the five always present states of mind. They call them mental factors in uh, Buddhist psychology, states of mind, I suppose, roughly. Form and feel, for, uh, feeling and discrimination. And these are they, why Buddha plucks those out from the groupings of 50, 51 states of mind that we study when we study the text called Lovig about the mind is because of their huge role in the in the causing of the in, in the in, in our causing ourselves our experience of samsara. So feeling, as I said before, is in that category called the, I call the mechanics, and it's 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 not meaning like an emotion. We're all given that we have mind, and indeed given that we have sensory consciousness as well. Then we have every millisecond, every millisecond, every millisecond. There's either a pleasant feeling, an unpleasant feeling, or a neutral one. So if you forget the, the neutral, we're we're only concerned about the pleasant and the unpleasant. Un unpleasant is called suffering. Pleasant is called happiness. So we're all junkies. So the only method. So this is where we have to understand attachment. The only method we have to trigger pleasant feelings is in the first level is by getting the objects of the senses. The ones that attachment likes. So it's very mechanical how the whole of samsara functions. That's why it's more important, it's so important we understand this, you know, the function of these different parts of our mind in relation to karma, especially. And feeling plays a massive role. So discrimination is every millisecond there as well. And it's simply the capacity, millisecond by millisecond, to discriminate between this and that. You know, you know, like if you open your eyes, you see I mean, a million things appearing right there, isn't it? And we can discriminate. We've got our intelligence. We've got this discrimination working nicely. You can discriminate colors and shapes and sizes and million things. So the key piece we need to really do the job, like we were talking yesterday, you know, um, Chrissy's question, to be our own therapist every day, to catch what's in our mind. It's not enough just to go, yeah, vaguely know what's going on. We have to be able to discriminate there's a hugely important mental factor between a virtuous thought and a non-virtuous one. And they're, having, they're running at a million miles an hour and all mixed like a big soup. So it's not an easy job. This is a huge part of our mind. It's good to use it. And why it's and it also but to see it on the negative side, how it perpetuates our samsara. You know. So there's form, which is physical. Then these two, Buddha plucks them out of the, of the mental factors and gives them this status. You know. Then the third one is sort of it's a, it's a grab bag of all the other leftover bits and pieces within impermanent phenomena so including all the other 49 mental factors and all the other bits and pieces that are impermanent but, but sort of into this little category it's a grab bag called non-associated compounded phenomena something like that compounded phenomena is another term for impermanence and the fifth one is called consciousness which they refer to as primary mind the main consciousness you've got the mental factors and the main consciousness so we're made up of that so these five aggregates so this first listing, Buddha says, there is no, within emptiness, there is no form, blah, 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 those five. And the next lot I call the 18 con constituents. The six, the six, the five senses, you know, no eye, no ear, sense consciousnesses. It says no eye, no ear, no nose. It doesn't mean this. It means no eye consciousness, ear consciousness, which is the part of your mind that functions through the eyeball, through the ear, all the bits and pieces, you know the five senses, plus they call it sometimes the six senses. The fifth, the sixth one is called mental consciousness, not how we call it a sense, but within the way our mind works, but the five senses plus mental. So this first lot are the six senses. Then the next six are the objects of the six senses, taste, smell, touch, blah, blah, blah. The next lot are called, a, there's a subtle kind of physical energy that they talk about. We don't posit that, that, that functions with in combination with the six senses, so the 18 constituents. Then you've got the, I think it's the, the 12 links, this way Buddha taught about how we, we, we perpetuate samsara, you know. 
And then uh, the next one, I think is maybe first, I forget, is the Four Noble Truths, you know. And then there's no wisdom, no attainment, no non attainment. Okay, he talks like that. So we have to contemplate all of these repeatedly, understanding how they have no inherent nature. That's what we have to do. And it says there's no wisdom, there's no attainment of wisdom. I mean, the, there's no wisdom meaning within the, within the meditation on emptiness, there's no appearance of these things. Saying like that. Another way, of course, to think about it in general is that, um, you know, everything that exists, all these categories, all these phenomena, these conventional phenomena, have no inherent nature. So it even says there's no wisdom, that wisdom is empty. Then it says that even the attainment of wisdom is empty. And then it says there's no non-attainment. And all that's referring to is the emptiness of attainment of wisdom, because even emptiness is also empty. Everything that the general point in Buddhism is the fun, certainly the Prasangika Majamika view. There's different views and different schools of thought. But from this perspective, every phenomenon that exists necessarily lacks an inherent, uh, inherent nature. Every phenomenon that exists conventionally exists as a dependent arising. It conventionally exists in dependence upon various factors, causes, parts, and finally, the mind that imputes it. Three levels of dependent arising the Buddha teaches, specifically here. Millions of ways that things exist in dependence upon causes and things, uh, characteristics. But here, this is a very particular point, and he's arguing with the prevailing views before. So every phenomenon that exists, everything that exists, lacks intrinsic existence. And in fact, even as I said yesterday, emptiness not only doesn't contradict existence, it proves existence. But our instinct, because of deluded views, is to see them as separate. The two extreme views. We have to kind of bring in the more if we think about dependent arising and emptiness, the more these view, we lessen the neurotic views and kind of we're bringing the two, the two truths ever closer, ever closer until eventually you have the middle way view, the final middle way view is when you're a Buddha and you simultaneously cognize conventional and ultimate, dependent arising and emptiness simultaneously. They're like the flip sides of a coin. There's many logical reasons we can use to prove emptiness, but the best one, they say, is dependent arising. That's why Tsongkhapa, that beautiful song of experience, you know, he wrote the verses in praise of Buddha for his teachings on dependent arising. So if everything we cognize, we necessarily see it through the lenses of our delusions, finally the root delusion that, in, that it causes everything to appear to us as having its own nature from its own side, out there, in and of itself, self-existently, inherently, independently, all of these are synonyms. This is this root delusion in the mind, the deepest, most primordial misconception. It then gives, you know, this, then gives rise to this powerful emotional hunger called attachment to get what that fantasy I want. And it's in a constant state of panic to get it and has a mental breakdown when it doesn't, and that arises as aversion. And all the other dramas come out of all these three, you know. The young Ling Rinpoche, I don't know if he's been here. He went, I must have come here, haven't you? Ling Rinpoche has been here, haven't you? Yes. Ling Rinpoche came. Yeah, I remember he, he often states that, um, you know, they always talk, we were hearing Buddhist teachings as 84,000 delusions, you know, 84,000 neurotic states of mind. And I always ask the Geshe's, what text will I find it in? And they say, you can't. I'm sure it must be somewhere, because Buddha did teach it. But anyway, he says, 21,000 of those 84 are rooted in, of the three poisons, are rooted in ignorance. 21,000 are rooted in attachment. 21,000 are rooted in aversion, and the fourth 21,000 are rooted in all three, meaning they've all got the, step, the characteristics, you know. All these states of mind have got the very precise characteristics. So, for example, there's aversion, you know, anger. Now, curiously for us, a jealousy is rooted in anger. We think, oh, it's because of attachment. Well, everything's because of attachment underneath, but it's got a particular flavor of anger. You think about that. 
you can't get angry that a person should dare to be dare to, dare to be happy, you know. How dare they be happy, really? It's like anger. Surprising to think. Now, arrogance or pride is rooted more in ego grasping, in ignorance. It's a very, it's an over-exaggeration of me. You know? Low self-esteem, the same. So that's very that's why we have to, in the Buddhist view of these different states of mind, and this is specific to Buddha. This is not Jung's psychology. This is not Freud. This is Buddha, you know. Coming from his genius Indians before him. As Jalama Lama says, it was genius Indians more than 3,000 years ago who began the investigation to the nature of self. And we Europeans think it was Mr. Freud 100 years ago. It's ridiculous. Buddha came out of that. The sophisticated, precise, detailed deconstruction of the components of the mind, not neuroscience, internal, subjective. It's incredible. And where did they get this information from? Not looking in the sky, looking at their own mind internally, because they've got single point of concentration. Precise, you know, and the more precise we can be about the different states of mind we've got, that's what we need discrimination for. That's what we need mindfulness for. That's what we need attention for. And these states of mind have to play their role in our getting ever deeper, ever deeper into our own mind, hearing the, the, the precision, the subtlety of the thoughts beneath the gross emotions. You know, we think the emotions are more powerful than thoughts. This is completely mistaken. So if it is true that everything appears to us as a result of the ego grasping, the root delusion, maripa, ignorance, that we can say ego grasping kind of when we relate it to the self. Everything appears to us, everything, as having this inherent nature, having a, a nature, having, having an independent character of existing independent, inherent, intrinsic, independent, self-existent are all synonyms. But it seems to me the one that's most tasty is independent. Independent of what? Let's ask the question. Independent of causes, independent of parts, more subtle, and most subtle, independent of the very mind that cognizes it. So everything appears to be independent. We can see this. Look at the chocolate cake. Forget even ego grasping. All the delusions have this function. But they've all got their own flavor. So attachment, which exaggerates the deliciousness of a cake, we, we know it's like this. The cake appears out there on the plate, just sort of separate from us. Like we have our mind, as the plumbers ever said, we don't think our mind plays a role in how it appears to us. This is the most profound thing to see. We see it as separate. We see it out there from its own side, kind of vibrating deliciousness, as if you put a spoon of deliciousness in the cake along with the, the chocolate and the sugar. We see it as an absolute characteristic of the cake. We know that. Nothing to do with me, not to do with my view. Well, you know, the, the delusions that are playing out right there are attachment, which is under which is underpinned by ego grasping. So the attachment exaggerates the deliciousness. The ego grasping, the, the ignorance, the maripa, it, you know, exaggerates the very ontological status itself of delicious cake. It's the most subtle. That's what delusions do. That's their nature. That's their function. That's how they work. And that's why they cause us suffering. Because they're presenting the outside world back to us, as Lama Zeba says, wrongly. You've got your wrong glasses on. It's so simple. But we forget, of course, because we believe in whatever we see. This is what keeps us stuck in samsara. So if it is true, that everything out there appears back to us wrongly. The first thing we have to do is establish this conventional characteristic. You can't get to emptiness before you get to get conventional. You can't possibly understand the emptiness of something if you don't first establish what, what that something is conventionally. So you want to establish its conventional nature first. So how do, what do we do? How do we do that? Well, you you you, you have to say, you have to name something. Oh, I haven't got my thermos today. Never mind. I don't. I haven't got any hot water at all. I'd love. To, I left mine behind. Chrissy's doing it. It's okay, David. Go. Well, you do it. Go on, go, go. So I can put some hot water in my thermos. But I think, where's my thermos? Maybe it's on the table. If not, give, give me the old thing, David. Doesn't matter. 
so I'll use something else as an example. So here we have glasses. So right now, because of ignorance, the glasses appear to my mind as having a nature independent of whatever's in my mind out there from its own side. And of course, we say that and we go, yeah, that's right. That seems to be how it works because the, the mistake is so absolute, we can't see it. Really. So the first thing to do, we have to establish correctly what is existing convention. And this is the entire path. This is the entire path. Right now, Buddha says we are not only not even getting clear what exists conventionally, we are even, forget about not knowing ultimate, but we're not even in touch with reality conventionally. We're living in la-la land. We have so many, he says, misconceptions about what does exist even conventionally. So you could argue the first stages of the path are all getting our minds in sync with that which exists even conventionally. And even that can bring joy and happiness and continuous happy future lives with no bad things happening because you abide by the laws of karma, you see things as impermanent, you, you develop compassion and love. All of this, this is a conventional, thank you so much. This is the conventional reality. So we're living in, not only are we living in la la land with all the emotional afflictions, but the Buddha would suggest we're living in la la land in relation to what exists in the universe, what the very universe is. So he says the universe has got trillions of sentient beings. They all create their own minds. There's no creator. Your mind isn't your brain. All these views that Buddha has, they're his observation of what's real, what's real, what exists. Don't just believe him. Take it on board. You're working hypothesis. You work with it. So getting things established conventionally is the first step. So I, would, you know, I use this example. What's that? I say, mummy, what's that? That's a thermos. She gives the name. Then she has to define it for me. What is it? I've got to know what it is, which means what's its job? What does it mean? What's its function? These words are all the same. So she'll give me the definition. The first part is the conventional characteristics, flat bottom metal container. I can see that. But this is, and the crucial piece is the second part. This is vital. She's got to know the second piece in order to then realize the emptiness of how you can't find that inherently how its function, basically what a cup is, what a thermos is, as the second part tells you, it holds my tea. It keeps it warm. Don't believe her, she has to prove it. You've got to prove it. We're trying to establish something that's conventionally existing. So she will go get her tea and she'll pour it in, she'll put the lid on and we'll come back in four hours and it will be proving to be true that it keeps her tea warm. She's now proved it to be true, that's still not enough. We've got to make sure there's no other conventional cognition of such a thing in our world that contradicts that. Once we've established this, we tick the boxes and we now all agree that is a thermos. Now we can communicate. If we had just that even conventionally, the world would be blissful. We'd all agree on what good means, what bad means, what up means, what down means. We wouldn't have any conspiracy theories and dramas and wars because we'd be in touch with conventional reality, which means virtue and goodness. Oh my goodness, imagine. Once you establish conventional, now you, can, now you have to look for, investigate, to find the independent holder of, hold, keep, uh, the, 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 the keeping the warmer of my tea. Because thermos is shorthand for keeping my tea warm. Thermos is shorthand for the function of keeping my tea warm. Eyes are shorthand for that which sees shape and color so you give the function of each thing and we have to look for that because we think it, it we think that function happens independently of causes of parts uh, in isolation and finally independent of the mind so buddha has this, this when we start to you know you start to study buddhist philosophy when, it, when we did the text called dura collected topics i don't know if you've studied it here is, is Venerable Gendon teaching it here? Collected topics? Dura? No? I mean, it's the first one you learn in the monasteries. The Lama Zopa didn't ever put it into the basic program. The Geshe's always wonder why, but they're polite and don't ask. But this, when I first studied, Lama Yeshi started, you see, the, FP, the FPM team. He called it the Geshe program back in Manjushri Institute in 1978, I think the first year was. And I joined it in 1979 or maybe 1980. I did two years with Geshe Tech Talk, who then was the... the Lama asked him to lead this Geshe program, the forerunner of the basic program and the master's program. 
So anyway, he studied the Buddha. So this is the first text you learn. You learn all the nuts and bolts of kind of the Buddhist worldview, you know, five aggregates, the impermanent, the 18 this, the 24 that, the five this, causes, conditions, effects, blah, blah. It's a whole kind of structure. You learn all the, the terminology. It's very helpful. So the very first thing you learn is that, the, that there are six, five or six synonyms for that which exists. And why this is so vital, because Buddha says we're living in la-la land, and we, he wants us to get in touch with that. So let's define those terms. So there are five synonyms, not only five or six. Object, not just meaning an object, physical. An object is that which exists. An existent, a phenomenon, an object of knowledge, an established base. All those five synonyms is that which exists. They've all got their own definition, all used in different frameworks. But the definition of an existent is amazing. They're all similar. The definition of an existent, what defines something as existing, is that which can be cognized by mind. That's incredible. That's not how we think in the world. We don't figure the mind at all. The subjective mind is not important. We don't trust it. The Buddha, what defines something as existing is the fact that it be cognized by mind. That's what seals it as an existent. Of course, a valid mind, of course, but a valid state of mind. That's so tasty. So, what Buddha, his whole path is getting us to get in touch with, first conventionally and then ultimately, that which exists. That's called omniscience. That it knows that which exists, because that's the job of the mind. The job, the mind, the job, the mind's job is to know that which exists, cognize, be aware, to be aware of, to cognize, to know their synonyms, that which exists. That's the job. And why? Because mind has that potential. That's the potential of mind. That's pretty intense. We don't think that way in our culture. That's the job of that's so when you're a Buddha. That's the potential of mind. Then add compassion to it, then you're a Buddha, you know. Wisdom on its own is not enough. And you won't get omniscience unless you have also compassion. Because the wisdom of, of when you've achieved your own nirvana is nowhere near as powerful and as vast and as astonishing as the, as, as, as the mind of a Buddha. Because the bodhicitta makes a powerful extra difference, you know. So in order to realize the emptiness of self, of I, you have to first establish what an I is, you know. Self, person, me, being, roughly. Now, being, technically, the world consists of superior beings and ordinary beings. Superior beings are anyone who's realized emptiness on up to Buddha. Then the rest of us are ordinary. But another way of saying it is, I think, also they say that there are, there are sentient beings and then there are Buddhas. So it's different ways they use the terms. Anyway, <clears throat> so, you know, when we go through the Lam Rim, the stages of practice, um, you're getting clear about conventional reality, you're calming your mind down, stopping grasping at nonsense, letting go of attachment, and all the emotional afflictions, the emotional delusions that, that present the world in, in a ridiculous way to us. We're starting to get in touch with karma, cause and effect, taking responsibility. We're starting to get compassion, all of these things, right? That's conventional reality. So when it comes to realizing the emptiness of the I, and we look at, so we look at the three types of dependent arisings. There's millions of ways that things exist and depends upon each other, up and down, short and long, you know, they de they're dependent. But this is very particular three ways, whereas I think Buddha's arguing with the, pre the prevailing views before. So the very first one is that things exist, the I exists in dependence upon um, causes. And we know that, like I think I mentioned already, but very pr crucial for the Buddha, the causes are, the main causes are within that mind of that I. We think it's mummy and daddy or God, you know? No, they're not main causes at all. Well, there's no creator role at all. Mummy and daddy definitely play a role. They give us a body. They, they behave in certain ways with us. But the, the main cause of me, I, person, is my past karma, my actions, driven by my delusions or my virtues. The main cause of me are inside me. The main cause of I are inside my mind. This is the massive point that Buddha's making. 
which takes her time to hear it. Shocking to us. Not a creation and not mummy and daddy. It's quite shocking. And so throughout our life, we are the main cause of what, our own happiness and own suffering. And the two, the two, this is the second noble truth, the two main causes, karma, meaning past actions of my body and speech, driven by second, a delusion. And they subsume to the, this is suffering, sorry, suffering. This is they subsume to the two, down to the one, and the mind. It's karma and the mind. And if it's suffering, the causes are the past actions and delusions. If it's happiness, the causes are the past action driven by virtues. So we are the main cause of our own happiness and suffering. So getting that right at the beginning, the very first stages of practice, the, the explicit teaching here is just to behave nicely and stop your future own suffering. So behave nice, don't kill, don't steal, don't lie, live in vows, purify every day. The explicit teaching is to control your body, speak, body speech, and mind. Control yourself, behave nicely. But the implicit teaching, as we start to practice abiding under the laws of karma, what starts to come, it, it loosens the grip of ego grasping. Because it's the first, it's an example of the first kind of dependent arising, which is the king of logic to prove emptiness. So as we get used to the idea of karma, taking it on board, really living according to it, really interpreting our lives that way, we're not just keeping it in our head. It transforms us from being victim, hopeless, angry, depressed, jealous, attached, to being self-confident, in charge of our lives, courageous, able to own what happens, because this is what comes from karma. So the implicit teaching of karma, right at the beginning, being dependent arising, that I am the, the result of my own causes, it loosens the grip, as Lama calls ego, the self -pity, of the self-pity me. So already it's an amazing example of emptiness, dependent arising, the key of logics to prove emptiness. Then you get to the second scope, the second part of the work where you really start digging deep into the mind, where you actually become a Buddhist. The first level of practice is essentially abiding by the laws of karma, well, good communists do that. Good Christians, good Muslims, it's not unique to the Buddha. His approach is fairly unique, but behaving nicely is, is, is agreed upon by all reasonable people. So that's nothing special. But the second one is unique to the Buddha. His view of the mind, we start to dig deep into the mind. And again, the explicit teaching there in the middle scope is understand your delusions, look at attachment, look at aversion, N really become familiar with the pain that they cause me, the disturbing characteristic of them. But as we start to practice this, we start to get deeper into these delusions. And as Lama Zopa only ever teaches, we start to hear how they are delusional. They misrepresent the world to us. They are misconceptions. This we only really hear about when we get to the middle, the great scope. And we start to realize emptiness, we get to depend on rising. It's only there they really start to teach about their misconceptions that mislead us. This is what we learn even in the middle scope. When you once you've calmed your mind down and see the pain of attachment, the pain of anger, the pain of jealousy, how they are the source of your pain, you then start to realize how they're misleading you, their misconceptions. This is helping us understand emptiness as well. So all of the path, the path of steps lead to this. You know. So the first level of dependent arising is causes. The I, or cup or computer, whatever exists, at least in this case, the impermanent phenomena, is the product of causes. And among all those causes, you will not find I. I remember when I studied with Rishi Chekchov, my philosophy teacher at Manjushri, and he used the example of a phenomenon called Rabina. And he said, it can be said that everything in the universe up to the moment of Rabina can be said to be a valid cause and a condition for the existence of Rabina. Of course, I remember it, because he talked about me. But I thought it was mind-boggling, you know? Because once you start going back for causes, is if we all want the first cause. This is the deepest delusion we have. There's a direct result of ego grasping. It's a misconception, it's a misquestion, it's, a, it's a, an absurd question for a Buddha. But we all want and utterly in the bones of our being believe must be a first cause. The Christians have a very deep, and I'm not criticizing, they have a very in depth philosophical presentation of how there can be a first cause, capital F, capital C, which of course they call God. But for the Buddha, it's not viable, it's not possible, it's impossible. 
just to believe that you do the work internally. It's not a possibility. There can be anything like a, a consciousness, a being, who can be the pro not the product of causes. So the idea, that's why the idea for Christians is so shocking and Muslims to think that you are an ordinary person, which is Buddha's view. Ordinary people like you and me can become perfect, can become a Buddha. That is a shocking idea. So the view for Christians is that there has to be this inherent energy called God who has always only been perfect and doesn't have a cause, that they put it above everything else. That's not valid to the Buddha. So the very first one, why did I mention God there? What happened? First level dependent arises is that I am the product of causes. Oh yeah, so get your check job. So you, you start looking at all the millions of causes. So the first, so you're not going to find the first cause. So you go go back, you know, well, the main cause of Rabin will be her, let's say her mum. Take that track. Then once you start thinking, well, my mum had a cause, then that her mother had a cause, and that mother had a cause, you're not going to get back to the first mum. Everywhere you turn, in all the billions of causes of Rabina, you keep going tracking back, tracking back, and you will cover the entire universe, logically. But among all those causes, there's no Rabina. Rabina is nothing other than the coming together of the causes, but among them, you won't find Rabina. Then the second level we're going to discuss now is parts, and we did that bit yesterday, the IKEA one. that I, person, me, exists in dependence upon its parts, my bits and pieces. So that we see that, it's pretty evident. This phenomenon called a person is made of many bits and pieces. And we can see that they are, they're the body and the mind, that's it, they're the components of a person. Billions of bits of mind and billions of bits of body coming together in all, the right, in all the right configuration, with the right number of bits and pieces, all doing their job, functioning as Rabina. So this, the, the work that they talk, you know, Pabonka in the Lam Rim talks about, this is the method coming from Tsongkhapa, you learn to, 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 to look into this one. So there are four points in, in the Lam Rim, as we know. We have to, so Buddha's telling us there is no intrinsic I, there's no independent I, there's no I that's independent of its parts. There's no I that's separate from the parts. You won't find a piece called I among the parts, which is, is the instinct we have. If you're a Christian, it's not an instinct. You, you learn it. It's your soul. It comes from God. It's the Atman, if you're a Hindu. Buddha doesn't posit something like that. He just posits consciousness, mind, and body. That's it. But mind, of course, isn't just the brain. It's not the brain. We're talking about the non physical, subjective, cognitive process itself that goes to incredibly subtle levels. And so we want to know, we, the first question is, well, where did I come from? Where's my first cause? Where did I begin? Where did the universe begin? Where did anger begin? Where did suffering begin? We always want a first cause, instinctively, because of the misconception of ego grasping, which sees things as having no cause, you know, being permanent, unchanging. The Buddha says we can't have such a thing. So we've got this is why we learned first in Lama Zepha when he started teaching Westerners in the in Kopan, he'd start with the beginninglessness of mind, which is the nuttiest idea to us. But not just mind, I mean the entire universe, for the from the Buddhist point of view, especially looking at the Vajrayana teachings, the universe consists of precisely two phenomena, types of phenomena, minds, mental consci consciousnesses, mind streams, and matter. And matter consists of the four elements. That's where, he, that's where he incorporates all the different realms of existence. The animals, their physical energy is made up of the four elements. There are spirits. Their physical energy is also made of the four elements, but predominantly air energy because you can't see them. Hell beings, you could argue, also their physical energy, because we've all got physical energy, the four elements. The predominance is there, you could argue, it's fire. Their minds are conjoined with fire. But they're also all the four elements are there, but different configurations. Gods of subtle life bodies, their, their physical energy has been so purified by virtue for so many eons, for so many lifetimes, that now reborn their mind conjoined with life energy. So their, their experiences are blissful, are joyful. So the universe consists of the four elements, matter and minds. And both of them are necessarily the product of cause and effect. Therefore, you cannot find, by definition, a first cause because that implies it didn't have a cause. And if that's so, then the whole logic of cause and effects you know, collapses into a heap of nonsense. Dalai Lama has all these discussions with scientists, you know. Big Bang, no problem. 
just not the first Big Bang, that's all. This is a mind-bogglingly different view. Because even though we go back into to billions of years in our culture, we only go back into this universe, so we can see. You know? Buddhism is much vaster, his view of the universe. So, everything in the universe up to the first moment of I is a cause and a condition for the existence of I. Very fascinating. That's the first one, causes. Now the second one, the parts. Everything that exists. This is the point now where the Buddha starts talking about impermanent and permanent phenomena. We get very confused about that. It's a very specific meaning. Permanent, um, it has the meaning of unchanging. There's, okay, in Buddha's first presentation of how things exist, which we need to hear before we get to emptiness, is that things are impermanent. But he's got a grosser level of, of, of describing impermanence and a subtler one. And subtle impermanence can only be cognized in subtle meditation. So gross impermanence is pretty evident. Death is an example. Cup of breaking, bodies getting old, relationship ending. The whole universe, the whole physical universe is living in the, in, within the law of gross impermanence, changing moment by moment. The subtle level is that within the very existence of this cause is also implied the effect, you know. They talk about the very existence of a cause already implies an effect. We can only really realize subtle impermanence in meditation and it can be confused for emptiness. In one of the earlier philosophical views before the Pajamika, Majamika, the Prasangika Majamika, their view of gross selflessness is the view of subtle impermanence of the next school. So they've got these different, there are different interpretations of these things, you know. So, in, so permanent is the opposite to impermanent from the Buddhist perspective. But philosophically, it means that, that, that thing, there are some phenomena that do exist that don't depend upon causes that are not changing from moment to moment. And it's a, it's a bit abstract for us because it doesn't apply to our daily life. And this is where we, and by understanding empty, by that emptiness is an example of that. So I have to get our heads around that because it seems, it almost seems like getting off on a track that's not relevant if we just try and get, understand these things simply. So it's a very conceptual kind of, it's, it's a certain kind of conceptual phenomena that, uh, that don't have the characteristic of changing from moment to moment or of being causes. In a way, it doesn't affect our daily lives. I mean, I don't want to go into it because I guess this gets us confused sometimes. So we'll leave it, maybe we'll leave it there. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So everything that exists in the second level of dependent arising exists in dependence upon bits and pieces. And among all, this is the point, among all those thousands of bits and pieces, We think, Buddha says, that there is a very special piece, that kind of like the boss piece, that runs the show called I. Like I said, all our language, our day-to-day -day lives are totally dominated. The central player in our head is called I. So it's very, this, this business, we started, I said, when I said I have a cup and a thing, an ear and an eye, there's a really major discussion in the debate we have to do in order to prove emptiness. They talk about how this is, they use this in the philosophical text. They say it's the exam, it's the using the, using, uh, if something exists, there has to be one or many. If there have, something exists, there has to be one or more than one. So, you know, um, so another way of putting it is if we say a word, ideally, that word should refer to something that's real, isn't it? Really helpful, which is what the, the business of getting in touch with reality. And you have to point to something that, 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 the word is, that, that the word is an indicator of. That would be reasonable to expect that. So just like I said, if I say I have a phone and an iPad and a, and a, and a thermos, you immediately hear that sound, you know English, you know the definitions, you look over where the sound's coming from, and you will verify that there are three phenomena there. So the word I refers to this, the word thermos refers to that, and the word phone refers to that. So that's, that's, that's a valid cognition, a valid statement. So if I say to you, like we said yesterday, the E and the I, I'll do another example. I have anger, I have, I have, you know, I have anger and I have love. It's three, again, three words, isn't it? 
three words. So that means I have to point to anger and I'll describe it to you and you'll agree and you'll agree I must have it if I tell you the definition. And I'll point to, to love. So the word love points to something, the word anger points to something, but what does the I point to? We're assuming it's a thing walking hand in hand with love and anger. We assume it's a thing that's walking hand in hand with the ear and the nose, because that's how we say it. We say it, we give equal status. I, love, anger. I, nose, ear, it's three things. I, knee, foot, three things. Now, in, in terms of you and me, that is two. Anna is one and I'm one. That's, that's clear within the fact of, of, of a group called two people that is Anna refers to this person and I refers to this person. But within this I, that's when it gets tricky. The same as the thermos. My thermos has a base. My thermos has sides. Well, put the sides there, put the base there. Where the hell is the thermos? You won't find one. It's pretty evident, but it's sort of, you think, well, who cares, you know? I don't get the point. So we're exaggerating, we're embellishing the actual status of the thermos. So we're embellishing the status of I. Of course, in a much more elaborate way, of course, you know. You won't find a phenomenon in here walking hand in hand with all the other bits. It's called I. As simple as that. We have been believing since the beginning of this time that there is one. And that's how we feel. I mean, talk about that's how we feel. The agonies and the pain and the anxiety and the worries and the fears and the jealousy and the depression, the low self-esteem and the pride, every bit of any of those is all rooted in the belief in the I. All the suffering, all the relationships, all the neediness, all of this, all the pain, the, all were rooted in the belief in an I. A separate I, independent I, set in stone I, real, pointable, findable, little piece called I. Nonsense, Buddha says. It's the source of your pain, baby. So the first, it's a, you know, Buddha says, there isn't one, but honey, don't just believe me. You've got to prove it to yourself, obviously. So he wants us to search for it. So this is a four point analysis. So obviously, if you want to search for it, if you want, like I said about the iPad, yes, if you want to search for an iPad, honey, you better know what you're looking for. You'll be in big trouble. You search for 42 eons, you'll never be certain. So you've got to know exactly what my iPod, iPad looks like. First point, establish the object to be negated. Identify the object to be refuted. And this is the hardest job. Lama Yashi says in Mahamudra that once you've established Abs with absolute certainty, what you think the ind independent I is, the second you've established it, you already realize the emptiness of it because you know you finally found out, you, you finally know what it is. And same with my iPad. You listen to this. There's you know 20 iPads even on the on the 20, 20 iPads on the table. And I say, please, when you go and find my iPad for me on the table. But you have to know what it looks like. So if you look in there. And you go in between the 20 iPads, you can search for five hours, six hours, 10 hours, and you're guessing, was it that one? Maybe it's that one. Perhaps you'd like this one. Maybe it's this one. You will never know because you haven't established the object, well, to be found in this case. Very clear. So what are the options? Once you've established with certainty the exactly my iPad, in within a half a second, you can glance on the table and you can know with certainty either there is Rabina's iPad. You give it to me and I thank you. End of discussion. Or, and there's a point here, you will establish with certainty it is not there. And that's when you discover the absence of my iPad. That's the absence of the inherent existent I. But you can't know the, if there is an errant, inherent existent I or not until you know what you think it is. This is the tricky part. This is the first point is the hardest one. Because it doesn't exist anyway, but we've been believing in it for so long. So we have to get, become familiar with how it feels to us. They, they would say how it appears to us. And it's incredibly subtle. So I'll read you in a minute soon from Lama in, in the chapter on how to find, how to look for the eye and find Mahamudra. How to look for the eye, but find the emptiness of the eye. So that's the way to say it. You know, you know, like you, um, 
you look for the iPad. The iPad's easy because you can find an iPad. An iPad can exist. It's a good analogy. You have to first know what the iPad is, then you, you and there's only two options. It's either there or it's not. Isn't it? It's hardly complicated. But until you're certain what you're looking for, you won't know. So until you're certain about what the I is, you can never. So there's two options for the I. And this is the four-point analysis. First, you establish what it is you're looking for. Second, you establish the parameters of your search, which is that either an I is oneness with the parts, or it's separate from the parts. And then once you've done this analysis, the, the conclusion will be the recognition of the emptiness, the absence, the absence, the never existing of the intrinsic I. Very thorough, rigorous, disciplined, precise work to be done. And you can't do that until you've done the earlier work of what is karma, this, that, impermanence, the mind, the di all the different parts of your mind. As Lama Yusi says, people rush off to meditation and end up in a psychiatric hospital. The mind is a powerful thing, and it's got imprints in it from countless lifetimes. As soon as you sit down quietly, you're going to invite them to come to the surface. People go mad. You better know what you're doing with your mind. Of thorough, solid practice. Masses of purification, masses of, you know, virtue and goodness and clarity, hard work, living in your vows. That's the preparation. So, We hear, we can see the suffering of attachment, I think it's very evident. We can see the suffering of, of anger, exaggerating the person's ugliness, exaggerating the person's beautiness. We can see the traps, but it's harder to identify the trap that believing in an intrinsic eye causes because it's too subtle for us. It's just too, like, who cares? So I can't see it. We can't taste it. We can't, we can't, um, you know, we can't uh, put the, join the dots. That's why stories like Rimache's little boy drowning. I didn't know about anything about emptiness, but there was no fear. That's very tasty. And if we understand this idea, which takes us time, that actually the delusions, all delusions are absolutely rooted in total fear. We are living in fear all the time. Levels of, and we know this more and more in our lives, more and more levels of anxiety and worries and fears and thinking about things never stopping. That's fear. The anxiety, the tightness of all those states of mind, which we are so used to, we think as being a normal person. We can't even conceive of the possibility that our mind can be radiantly joyful every minute, even before you realize emptiness, just by having virtue. That doesn't make sense to us. I mean, we know people like that. We know some people, we don't quite understand why they're like that, you know? We all know people like that, who are just jolly and happy. I mean, they're either lying to us, in which way they're having mental breakdown every day, but just pretending. Or some people are just genuine, because their minds, they have, you know, their minds are capable due to past karma they're not so deluded and, and they've got a lot of virtue a lot of kindness and patience and really this is one way it sounds so boring when we say attack when we say anger for example we never think in the world that anger is a big deal we just think you got must have a problem your mother must have beaten you or you've been raped by somebody or you've got psychotic we have all these fancy words excuse me but it's called anger people it's very simple it's called anger look at the damage of it beyond the imagination the suffering of anger Look at people who are patient and look at people who are humble. They are happy people, in fact. They're happy people. But if you've got pride and anger, they're bumping into things continuously, bumping into people with such pain. We're continuously experiencing mental pain, anguish, hurt, all based on the I, you know, it's so evident. Forget yourself, we know other people like that. We can see it so nakedly. Don't worry about what their parents did to them. That's why we're so convinced in the West we've got a, uh, this long analysis of what happened when you were a baby. What's so shocking, and as we can see it, when you look at the mind from a Buddhist perspective, it's got nothing to do with what anybody has done to you. You just go straight to your own mind. Okay, you've got to factor in karma. I mean, we, you know, in the West we factor in the past. It's right. Well, so does Buddha. It's called karma. So, you know, since a little boy, you've been, you've been sort of... Um, uh, torturing creatures, and now you end up torturing people and eating their brains. Clearly, it's not just attachment and aversion that causes you to do that. 
It's your past, baby, which means past lives. So knowing karma is a major way to help yourself and help others. And how you know your own is by seeing the strength of your tendencies. So it's playing music or being kind or being angry. You bring your tendencies with you. You've got to factor those in. We can learn to know our own minds intimately. Don't have to know what your boyfriend did or what your mother said. You must factor in the physical as well, you know. So if you take your Tibetan doctor, you go to your Tibetan doctor and she'll feel your pulses and she'll feel completely berserk wind energy, which is why you're making, you're completely crazy, out of control, OCD or anxiety and panic attacks. Well, she will diagnose it as the winds related to your attachment is completely berserk. So she'll give you herbal medicine, which you take for a few months. It'll calm your wind energy down, which will calm your attachment and your berserk mind down. It's utterly the relationship between the physical and the mental. So you don't ignore the physical. We have to learn to know our minds. So, okay, back to dependent arising. The I, my I, so the first search is you have to you have to look into the logic of arguing with how there can't be an I that's separate from the parts, that's indicated by I have a nose, two nouns, two things, must be an I there that owns the nose. Well, the other one is it's all me, you know. How dare you insult my nose? How dare you insult me? No, Rabina, I insulted your nose. So both of these mistakes, so there's, there's arguments and, and you hear him chase teachings all the time. So the one argument he talks about all the time, the, the logic he uses for one is, um, you know, how we think it's all of me. And that it, so the, 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 the thing we have to become familiar with is the label I can't be the base. The base of the label I as these parts, this aggregates. This is the base for the label I. This parts and bits and pieces, the bits and pieces, the parts are the base for the label thermos. We say there's the thermos. Conventionally, you're correct, but we have to analyze it because we over, overstate this existence of the thermos, thinking there's a thermos nest there. We don't think we think that, but we do. So that's the mistake. So technically, you know, Rabina, as Lama Zopa said, I realize the person known as the Laudo Lama is about to die. Because the name Laudo Lama can't be the same as the body and the mind. Because if it were, why would you say, I have a body? If you think your body is you, if you're saying it's the same, and that's again the one and many example, if you say I and mind are the same there's one phenomenon there can only be one phenomenon there can't be more than one phenomenon so if i is equal to mind then there's one phenomenon so you'd never say the word i you'd say mind has mind i have i and then you've got a body well i and body are oneness there must be one phenomenon i mean this seems a silly argument but it's very logical and the other one is the owner you know the boss that runs the show in there. So I have to prove both of these are wrong. And what you conclude with, what you find at the end of this search, what you find is the absence of that I. That's the realization of emptiness. Like finding the absence of the iPad. That's why even the shock when, you know, when Amanda goes up into her, 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 when Amanda goes into her, Amanda, right? Isn't it? Amanda goes into her bank account. She expects 5,000 pounds. She is shocked. She sees zero, but what appears to her mind vividly is the absence of her precious 5,000 pounds. So she discovered the absence of something, not nothingness, the absence of something. They're completely different phenomena. As Dalai Lama says, you just, you know, the search among all the parts, you chuck out all the bits and pieces and you end up with nothing. Well, you will end up with nothing. There will be nothing in there called I. You'll end up with no I, not nothing. You don't find nothing. You find the absence of I. It's a very different phenomenon for the mind to grasp that. Think about that. A person who doesn't expect tea in their thermos, who's not having the expectation of tea in their thermos, when they look in the thermos, they will see nothing. That's one phenomenon, nothing. But I'm expecting tea, so I'll see the absence 
of T. They're very different phenomena for the, for the mind to cognize. Two different things will appear to the mind. So it's not as if there's nothing there. You won't find a piece called I. As Dalai Lama says, I isn't empty of in independent existence because you won't find one. You won't. That's not the real premise. I is empty of existence on its own side because it's independent of arising. And that's what we finally realize. So as Lama Zopa says, when you realize the emptiness of I, there's not an atom of anything there that makes it I. There's no I-ness. There's nothing there. It's as if there's no I. It's so subtle. But he says there is an I, depending on arising. But what does exist is so subtle, it's as if it's an I. Not an I. It's as if, it's a, it, it's, it's as if there's no I. So it's not as if you have to microscope to get a tiny, tiny I, not like that. It's more subtle conceptually. When we say something exists, we have to point to it. That's, conven that's conventional reality. That's conceptuality. Conceptuality, by definition, is dualistic. Can't help it. So if you say something exists, you have to point to it. And you can't point to an eye in here, as the Buddha's telling you. And the recognition of that, the, the actual experience, non-conceptual level of that, one day in your meditation, the first second of it, when you finally see non-conceptual, direct perception, direct insight, with absolute certainty, there never has been, isn't, and never could be that kind of eye. That second, you cut the root of samsara. And I said, as Lama Yeshi says, Lama Yeshi says in Mahamudra, you can only see that at the subtlest level of single point of concentration, direct perception. You can't get it at conceptual level. We, we, we can start like we are at conceptual level. It's a stepping stone. That's like the recipe for the cake is conceptual. It's not the cake itself. Don't fool yourself. But it's a stepping stone to get the taste of the cake, isn't it? Same, like the theory leads you to the experience. So, of course, here with Mahamudra, let's read more about Mahamudra then. It's not that approach at all. It's direct. It goes straight to the experience of it. So let's read a bit more about Lama. Lama's words about Mahamudra. Time is it? 11, 10, okay. Okay. Oh, what happened here? I haven't got it. I wonder if I've got my book itself in the in my bookshelf. Where is it? Where it is. Mahamudra. Mahamudra. What happened? Oh. There it is, okay. How to discover our true nature, Lama Yeshi. All right. Oh, it's a bit small on my iPhone, isn't it? It's not made for the iPhone. It's a PDF, you see. There are chapters. Okay. We should now seek the self and find Mahamudra. Just listen. Just listen to these words and contemplate, okay? Just listen to the words and contemplate. All right, so chapter nine. So now seek the self and find Mahamudra. So having become familiar with contemplating the clarity of our mind, or well, we had, we did it for like three minutes, but never mind. As the root set text says, an amazingly skillful method establishing stillness of the mind and a way to introduce the conventional mind. Why, you see, Mahamudra is about the emptiness of the mind. You start with realizing the emptiness of the self. The self, remember, is the word referring to the combination of the body and the mind. But Mahamudra is about finally realizing the emptiness of the mind. Let me read you His Holiness in the preface. I quoted His Holiness. Mm. 
Okay. Got to read it for us. Wow. Okay. Um. Okay. Okay, so in Mahamudra Meditation, Lama says, the object of concentration is our own mind. In particular, it's clarity, which is simply a subtle, a more calm, subtler level of your mind, not just a chat, 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 you know? It's silly conventional. As, and as His Holiness the Dalai Lama says in his commentary, which is a book that's been published by Snow Lion called The Gelugkagyu View of Mahamudra or something, is coming and it's using as well as other teachings, the teaching His Holiness gave on this same text at Lama Yeshi's request in 1982 in Dhamsala. And as His Holiness says, finally, the goal, so first is to realize the emptiness of the self. That's the emptiness of the self. This is what we're discussing here about the self, right? But then every, you see, everything is, everything is empty. So they say that we have to realize the impermanence, the, the emptiness of the person, and then we have to realize the emptiness of phenomena all the other phenomena that aren't persons. So the, the way to do meditating here is you first establish the emptiness of yourself, and then that leads you to realize the emptiness of, of phenomena, and the mind is an example of that, of phenomena. So it's a very tasty, internal, very, very tasty, tasty kind of example of a phenomenon, the mind itself. But I think because from this book, I can see that Lama, when he taught, most Westerns hadn't done any study at all. So even for us hearing here, self and mind, we get confused. They sound the same, you know, a bit confused about that. So Lama never really articulated clearly. He'd always say emptiness of self consciousness. He sort of mixed them together a bit because it suited our minds, you know. But there's different phenomena completely. Your mind is a component of I. Your mind and your body are the components of the I. So the, we need to understand the emptiness of the I. Then we have to understand the emptiness of the mind. And Mahamud is that. So as Hongas says, the goal is to realize the emptiness of the mind, its ultimate nature. So he says, as Hongas says, if we explain in terms of the middle way, in the middle way tradition of a correct view of reality, the usual method for gaining correct understanding is to realize the emptiness of a person, me, self, I. Okay? A conventional me. For this, we analyze the mode of existence of a person in terms of the five aggregates as the basis for labeling one. In the Mahamudra tradition, however, although we will still take as the basis for labeling a person the five aggregates, we focus primarily on the aggregate of consciousness as serving this function. Thus, the Mahamudra tradition presents a correct view of reality in terms of the emptiness of the mind. Okay. But first, this is back to the preface, me as the editor. First, however, it's necessary to realize the emptiness of one's self. Lama Yeshi says to start by focusing on the thoughts, whatever arises in our mind. And then when the consciousness settles, we focus on its clarity. Then once there is a reasonable level of concentration, in order to recognize that there's no independent self, the Panchen Lama says, quote, to investigate intelligently with subtle awareness, the essence of the individual who is meditating. Just like a small fish that moves in lucid waters without causing any disturbance. That's indicating the second component of the practice. I'm going to be reading Lama's chapter on it. But that, so the idea is you've sat down, we'll do that. Let's say we'll do that for five minutes, sit and watch the thoughts. Then we'll go to the second mode of, 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 of doing what Lama says. He tells you exactly what to do. So just follow along, do your best, okay? And I'll read the words, okay? 74, was it? 74? I think so. Okay. 
Okay, chapter nine. Seat yourself. If I have Mahmoud, but first you just sit, get your body organized, sit up straight in a chair, don't slump, feet on the ground, hands in the Mahmudra uh, in the meditation mudra. And very relaxed, very natural. Don't be for, don't force, don't get all holy. Just simply put all with determination. Just for a few minutes, okay? Determined. I'm gonna pay attention to whatever pops up in my mind. And don't worry about it, just keep the mind. You know, there's two things going on. There's all the supposed chatter out there, your mind, but then there's you with your attention. So have that very focused, very determined, very strong, not weak, don't space out, keep alert. You know, like the alertness you have to keep when you're driving a car, you can't afford to space out, you die. So there's a kind of alertness there and it keeps you sharp, doesn't it? But like that, an alertness to the attention simply watching your mind for a few minutes. Keep the mind sharp, focused, don't space out. Okay, I'm going to read Lama now, just stay focused and listen. So having become familiar with contemplating the clarity of our mind, as the root text says, an amazingly skillful method establishing stillness of the mind and a way to introduce the conventional mind, we can now move to investigate the wrong view of ego, how the ego perceives, so that we can realize Mahamudra, meaning the emptiness of our mind, our ultimate nature. So in order to experience Mahamudra, we need to, and Mahamudra is basically an equivalent of the word emptiness. Hear it like that, that's all. Lama often says non-duality, he means the same thing. Non-self-existence, I mean, um, non-self-existence, non-inherent existence, non-duality, emptiness, all referring to the same thing. In order to experience it, we need to destroy ego's conception, the hallucinated idealistic picture, the concrete view, this is me. So let's investigate this mistaken concept. Because if we can't recognize how ego mind projects its hallucination onto reality, our Mahamudra meditation will become Mickey Mouse meditation. 
it's very difficult to recognize this self entity that ego is holding. Lama's term, like self existence, he uses the term self entity, you know, that ego is holding. That is why we first calm down the grosser levels of mind in concentration meditation. Without this concentration, there's no way we can identify the unconscious levels of ego holding the independent self. And therefore, no way we can realize Mahamudra. We have to identify, and that's the object of negation. We have to identify the way we grasp, the way ego appears to us. Okay. So normally our sense of self is just a vague notion and our ordinary superficial mind never attempts to pinpoint it. So we must investigate deeply and try to identify exactly how we think this fantasy I exists. So I'll give you an example here. This is exactly what the Lamas tell us. You know, when you, something happens, like a shocking thing, like someone accuses you or you nearly get run over by a car, we know that fear arises. And why fear comes is because your sense of self has just been threatened. So ego grasping, the root belief, is sort of sitting there quietly most of the time like a lion asleep. It's, in, it's informing everything we see. It's informing the attachment. It's informing the anger. But it is not doesn't really get kind of touched until very strong thing happens. And then it wakes up and this panic arises, this fear arises. That's the indication of grasping at the eye. And so the Lama say, when that happens, it's a really good example. You should watch your mind so carefully because that moment is when the, uh, the, the feeling of your eye appears nakedly to you, but we miss it every time. So that if you're really advanced in your practice, this is how you use daily life experiences. When someone insults you, you, you don't freak out. Well, as soon as you freak out and start pointing fingers, you've just lost the opportunity. The real practice is to instantaneously grab how it feels internally and uh, begin to identify the way your eye appears independently to arise. That's an excellent way in daily life to practice. Yeah. We have to practice that because the first instinct is to defend ourselves, and then it's too late to miss the opportunity. So Lama Sankapa says that if you're afraid of a snake, but someone tells you that there's no elephant there, what good is that? Your problem is the snake. So you've got to identify what the problem is, in other words. You can sit there for 40 million years thinking you meditate on emptiness, meaningless, you're just spacing out. It's very precise. So the mindfulness fish. Lama has used this wonderful phrase. So let's meditate on Mahamudra. So we've done that a little bit, pretending first, as Lama says, achieve a level of concentration. So pretend we've done that. Now this is, so he says even, with, you know, first achieve a level of concentration that you are satisfied with, focusing on the clarity of your consciousness. This is not something I can pinpoint for you, saying it's exactly this or that. But perhaps we could say it's when you've had a couple of minutes without emotional distraction. Actually, that would be super. And be satisfied with that. Don't think, oh, only two minutes. I should be able to concentrate for 24 hours. Don't grasp. Otherwise, you'll lose everything. So then from this clean, clear state and without distraction, so now we're going to do the, Maham, the second part, the Mahamudra bit. We're going to, now we're going to investigate the opposite of Mahamudra wisdom our simultaneously born ego, this primordial clinging, okay? In his root text, the Panchanama says that you have to be like a fish moving through water without disturbing it. He quotes, from within that very state of earlier equipoise, investigate intelligently with subtle aware awareness the essence of the, of the individual, the person, I, who is meditating. Just like a small fish that moves in lucid waters without causing any disturbance. So the main meditation then is strong concentration on the clarity of your mind. So be doing that as I'm talking. 
So while you're doing this, your subtle analytical wisdom, your mindfulness fish, watches intently. In other words, it's like out of the corner of your eye. Like if you're driving on the freeway, you're totally focused on what's right in front of you. You're focused on everything, but you, out of the corner of your eye, you see everything that's going on. But you're not distracted. It's like that. Mama explains. Your mindfulness fish watches intently, ready to capture the way that ego mind perceives the self-existent I. So first to capture the way ego grasping perceives this I and simultaneously comprehend the non-self-existent I. That's the ideal, comprehend the absence of it. That's the ideal. So do not think that because you are attempting to concentrate on the mind, you can't at the same time have another part of your mind be aware, be watching. So I use the, the, the freeway. I'm going to use this example. For example, as you sit meditating, you still notice the sounds of the breathing of others, the movement in the room, but you don't get distracted. This is natural. So in the Tibetan text, they use the example of two people having a conversation while they're going for a walk. There is awareness of the road, but they're not watching the road, not thinking that it's a good road or a bad road. Okay. And don't think that the mindfulness fish is separate, like a separate thought. It's not. Yes, one part of your mind just keeps going, concentrating on the clarity, while another part, the mindfulness fish, watches intently. They do have different functions. So initially, you experience them as separate. But as you learn to let go, you will experience them as unified. Just as the rays from a light that shines on everything are part of the light, so your thoughts are part of the consciousness that oversees everything. Ego is like a thief. So what might happen is that the appearance of ego will come. You know, you'll catch it like when you get threatened, but you'll miss, but you'll miss it. It's gone. It's like a thief who walk, sneaks up on you when you're not looking and then hides when you turn around. If you try too hard to find him, he disappears. That's exactly how ego mind de deceives us. It's so sneaky, so intelligent. So instead of building up the strength of the ego, build up the strength of the mindfulness fish to catch the ego. Ego mind is saying, self-existent I, self-existent I. But your subtle wisdom, your mindfulness fish, is trying, is trying to recognize non-self-existent I, non-self-existent I. So now Lama goes through these different ways we can search, you know, and he just talks different things. A grosser level of ego's view. So is, if there is a real I existing, I mean, a separate piece, you know, what is it? You have to search. This view of ego has many levels, some grosser and some subtler. So first you have to think, well, is the I the body? You know, you'll experience many things. Lama J. Kappa says, sometimes you feel that the I is somewhere among the aggregates, in particular the body. Superficially, it seems that way. This body is the basis of our identity, isn't it? especially in the West, the body is emphasized. So ego mind strongly believes the essential self is related to the body. So check, use your mindfulness fish. Is it the, the nose, the ear, the other parts of your body? Is it inside the cells, the atoms? Ego thinks something must be here. Somewhere in this body, I am existing. Sometimes you'll feel this concrete sense of I in your heart. Sometimes it seems to be in your chest, other times in your head. Sometimes you might feel complete darkness, as if you're totally in space. The I is the mind, the combination. Now think, no, not only this body, maybe my mind is my I, maybe my mind is my I, or maybe the I is one part of the consciousness the subtle consciousness, my thoughts. Then with more analysis, check to see if the self is the combination of the body and the mind. 
I mean, this meditation, of course, I'm just touching on it. And this is the type of thing you should do, kind of in a way, in other type of, in, you know, in Mahamud, you're just watching. You're just watching. You're not doing much analysis. But all of this thinking is going to be in your mind. You're going to be checking, you know, carefully. Without, the key is, the key is what we say, Lama is saying is you don't ever lose concentration on the clarity of your mind. You never, you stay always focusing on the mind. And it's out of the corner of your eye with your mindfulness fish that you're checking for how the eye comes. So it's quite, it's, it's, you never vary, you don't move away from focusing on your mind. You stay there always. And it's out of the corner of your eye, the mindfulness fish, the thing that looking at it's got, it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. Keep your focus on the clarity of your consciousness. The mindfulness fish watches intently without disturbing the clarity. So this obviously implies a very subtle state, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So there are, the, these are ego mind's views, but they are on the grosser level. Lama calls ego mind, he means, people, other people say ego grasping, he says ego mind. So you have not yet discovered the projection of your simultaneously born ego. In other words, you haven't yet identified the, the, object, the object to be negated. You will see that ego mind's object is not the five aggregates body, not the mind, and not the combination. These are not what ego holds. They are not ego's problem, no. Yet it's not enough to think the I is not my body, not my mind, not the combination. In other words, that's a bit nihilistic. Well, there's no I there. Chuck everything out. That's not it. That's not the meaning. Nor is it enough merely to not have the appearance of the body as me, the mind as me, the combination as me. The disappearance of that kind of impression is not enough to realize emptiness. That again is like the nihilistic one. There's nothing there. That's not the meaning at all. Maybe you have the experience of going beyond your body, almost a feeling of no subject, no object. That is good, but it's not enough. Perhaps you have some view of what you think the self is. Maybe I am this, and then you discover the view is not right. I'm not this. That is not the realization of emptiness either. These experiences are good, but you haven't yet identified the nuclear energy of ego, the self-existent I, which doesn't exist, but which produces all the problems. Refuting these ideas is not enough to go beyond ego, not enough to discover the great seal of Mahamudra. It's the beginning, but it's not enough. The appearance of the real I is more subtle. Now investigate ego's real view. Go more deeply, check carefully, stay focused on the clarity of your mind. Move the mindfulness fish without disturbing the clarity. It watches intently. It is ready to capture the conception of ego. What ego mind is really holding is an I that exists from itself. We hear people talk using the term is from its own side, in and of itself. Lama's got his own way, from itself. It totally, the ego mind is really holding an eye that exists from itself. It totally believes, ego mind, that somewhere, somewhere deep inside you, solidly within you, beyond the body, beyond the mind, there is the concrete identification me. It is something that is quite unrelated, this I that is not dependent, that is not an interdependent phenomenon, that is not dependent especially on the name I, self. This feeling of an unrelated, independent, concrete, 
unmovable, unshakable self-entity me, an essential energy, an essential energy here somewhere. This is me. It's so deeply rooted. It's instinctive, spontaneous, beyond intellect. And it's continuously there. It doesn't matter whether you're asleep, awake, talking with others, on your own, or even if you forget yourself. Ego continually holds this concrete entity, I. Even if you imagine someone cutting your body into pieces until there's nothing left, you'll still feel that there's an independent, unrelated I there. This is so intuitive, so spontaneous. So with your mindfulness fish, watch for that I, the I that exists from itself without depending on the name that goes beyond your relative characteristics. Try to identify this I that you totally believe exists somewhere here the real I, the real self. Stay focused on your mind and have the mindfulness fish watching out in the corner of your eye. I'm going to do this for now. We'll continue with Lama later. Let's have a bit of a break. Let's have a cup of tea. But as Lama says, you, 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 do this, you do this job all the time. This is life. So when you're walking downstairs, you have the corner of your eye, you're watching for the eye to arise. If someone's a bit mean to you, you don't get the cup of tea you want, you're watching how the eye arises all the time. That's the job you have to learn to do. It's skillful. Focus on your job. We're watching out of the corner of your eye all the time. That's it. That's what we're trying to do. Not just watching for the eye, but watching the attachment, watching the angle, the voices of eye. That's practice every day. You know, we just get better and better and better at it. To see you, um, it's, it's 10 to, quarter to, quarter to. To see you in, I don't know, 20 minutes, isn't it? 20 minutes, something like that. We'll continue.
Oops. Okay. So, uh, questions. Anybody got any questions based on our morning's discussions? Questions. Any questions? Yes, there's one. Uh -huh. It's. Can you talk about the relationship? Into the mic a bit closer to me. I can't hear. Please, can you talk about the relationship between um, emptiness and dependent origination? Because one one describes conventional reality and one describes ultimate That's reality. That's right. But but I can't separate them in my mind. And they seem okay, to be I understand. Describing yeah. the same thing, right? They what? They seem to be describing There's the same thing. There's two different ways of saying the same thing. But the yeah, good. So the the, the general approach would be. that the, um, we try to realize the absence of inherent existence of the I, for example, the method to get that is to think about how it's a dependent arising. And that leads to the insight, oh, aha, therefore there is no I from its own side. It's the main logic to prove emptiness. So it's a t another way, seeing them both, they're equal, they're just different ways of describing the same thing. But the, the relationship is we have to think about, think about dependent arising, <clears throat> and that triggers the insight. Therefore, the I doesn't exist independently. Did I say? Got it. Thank good. you. Very good. Thanks. Hmm. Someone else. Hmm. Nobody else. Yes. Okay, I'm go. Yes, we have. Ms. Uh, Rose, talk to me, Rose. Mm -hmm. You, Rubina, thank you for the teachings. When the mindfulness fish finds the eye, um, what do we what do we do at that point? Well, if you if the mindfulness fish does actually locate accurately the way you grasp at the eye. If you, in other words, if you've identified actually the way the eye appears, if it is accurate, then that second you would realize emptiness. So what all you can do is catch it and then check it. You have to kind of catch it. You see, it's sort of like in our daily life, we have to think, do all this thinking, these different options that Lama said. What is the eye? Where is it? Is it the body? Is it the mind? All this, this is all the analysis we should be doing anyway in our day-to-day -day life and in our meditations. But when you do Mahamudra, having done all that in your daily life, you, you, you're learning to just observe. And it gets, and because if, you are, if it is, if your mind is subtle, you'd be, you'd, be, you'd be getting a feeling for it. So you might just get, a, as Lama says later, I'm going to read more. No, no, he said it. No, okay, there's more I'm reading. So sometimes you just might get a flash. Even just sitting here listening, we might get a moment, a second of aha, but then it's gone again, you know, because we can't sustain it. So every time you grab it, you get a feeling and you grow that, you grow those moments until eventually it's a genuine, a genuine realization that's stable. Do you understand? Where are you going? What happened to you? I can't see you, Rose. Does that make yeah. sense, Rose? Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. It's sort of like, again, don't, don't, don't mystify it. It's like learning anything. Like you're learning, you're studying that music or you're studying that IT. You learn it slowly. You get it for a second. You've got to keep studying until eventually it becomes automatic. It's a gradual, in the normal way of seeing it, it's a gradual process. You understand? Day-to-day -day life, thinking about it, every time you hear about these things, a little bit more, a little bit more kind of gets clear. It's a gradual process. So, of course, if you've got really good concentration and you've got some strong karma to meditate, you can get a very strong, you know, direct taste of it. But then until it's, until your mind is is in shamatha, until your mind is very subtle, it won't be a, a, a it won't be a real realization. It must be a glance, a glimpse, a taste, a moment, and they're good. So if you do just get a flash, a glimpse, you just stay on, you stay there. You don't do anything. You just stay keeping watching the mind, and you just kind of taste it. You know. Okay. Does that sound right? Yeah, I do. You stay there. Stay with the taste, basically. Well, yeah, yeah, but you don't waver. You never, as Lama says, you never waver from concentrating on the clarity of your mind. That's where the main part of your mind is, and that never changes. Right. Okay. Well, I'll read more of Lama in a minute. Anybody else? Huh? Hello, Shani. Let's talk to you. And Jennifer. Okay. 
Hello, Venerable Ramiya. Um, you mentioned the story about the little boy, and I'm just wondering how does realization of emptiness dispel the fear of death? I mean, what, how does that do that? How does it happen? Or, or why does it dispel the fear of death? Yeah. You mean the, exact, the story of Lama Zopo and the little boy, you mean? That story. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's not just a question of fear of death. It's a question of fear of anything. When you realize emptiness, you no longer believe there's an exist self-existent me. That means you no longer have attachment. You no longer have anxiety. You no longer have anger. You no longer have any of the neuroses because they're all rooted in the basic assumption of a me. When you've cut that, your mind can only be clear, not to mention virtuous, not to mention blissful. You can never not be like that once you've realized emptiness. You understand? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it seems science fiction to us. We don't posit that possibility in our culture. So we've got to hear it very carefully. And that's the trouble because it's not posited, these states of mind aren't posited by modern psychology or neuroscience. We then immediately think it's mystical and religious and you can't prove it, you know? Well, it's so superstitious. Because it's the biggest fear that we all have, the fear of us dying, isn't it? To get rid of that must be incredible. I mean, But it's not, an, it's not a fear that's in isolation. It's like if someone tries to, you know, if someone yells at you, there's fear. If someone takes your things, there's fear. If someone nearly crashes into you. I mean, we're having variations of this fear all the time because the eye is always getting attacked. And so we grasp onto our feeling of eye, which is what causes the fear. But when you no longer have any recognition, any, you, when you have a deep recognition that there is no intrinsic eye, then the mind is not fearful, can't be, not possible. Do you understand? Yes. Thank you. So we'll read Lama in a minute, but let's just do a little bit more of this sort of the way you would do this analysis. You know, if we're just looking at the using dependent arising in relation to parts as our analysis. As Lama Zubhita is pointing out, or as, as the, the teachings point out, we either believe that this, all of me, this big lump of, is me, that's very strong, or we believe there's an I in there that's sort of another part that owns everything. And, and this is how it must be taught, isn't it? I have anger, I have jealousy, I am this, I am that. You know, I had, I, so we assign both of these things to becoming either one or the other. So we've got to question both of these using very clear conceptual logic to argue with these assumptions to try and prove how they can't be possible. We've got to get some, some, con con some con conceptual conviction first. So one little example, you know, one little way of looking. You know, like I said before yesterday, if, if you see there are three separate phenomena very clearly, there's, there's a person here, there's a phenomenon, thermos, and there was a phone, but not now. So there's a, there's a book, three phenomena. It's pretty straightforward. Like I said earlier too, if you say a word, it has to refer to a thing that exists because a word is an expression of a thought and a concept is a thought and whatever you think, it ought to be a valid concept. And a valid concept is one that refers to something that exists. It's got an object that exists. It's referring to a, a phenomenon. You know, you can say, oh, la-di-da, you can say that. But we know it has no meaning. There's no thing there called la di da. We can't define it. We don't. It doesn't have a function. You see my point? And what Buddha's saying is, we're living like that. We're living just nonsense. We live in fantasy. People with their conspiracy theories, endless nonsense, daily made up nonsense, fantasy world. We and we think, oh, it's good to have fantasies. You understand? I mean, children aren't having fantasies if they sit there thinking they're mummy and daddy and having cups of tea. That's reality. That's nice. That's okay. But la di da and making up pure nonsense. Okay, again, if that nonsense is made up and you call it science fiction and there's got some virtue in it, some morality in it, that's okay. You get my point here. But it's just sort of meaningless nonsense or it's full of rage and anger. What's the point of those fantasies? That's terrible. We're discussing what's real, you know. So we say, I, this is a valid name for this phenomenon. We all accept that. We have to agree upon that. If you think I'm a toilet, then you don't agree. It's not, no, Rabin is a toilet. Then you've got to get clear what the definition is, you know. <coughs> there's a thermos and there's a book. So we just say this three, this that. So those three things exist. That's one point. Now the second point is they do happen to have no, they have no relationship. This is the massive point about dependent arising. There's no relationship between these three. 
I mean, you could say they all belong to Rabina, but that's not the point here. The relationship meaning they're independent of each other, meaning that the book can tear into pieces and fall down. This is untouched and this is untouched. That's showing there's no relationship. There's no dependent relationship. That's what it means by dependent. In this case, this kind. <coughs> you can see that. They're each separate and independent. It's clear. Now, it gets more nuanced when we say about I have an ear and a nose. There are three nouns there, I, ear, nose. And on a, without analysis, you can see it's true. But we have to analyze why. Because when we say I and ear and nose, we're seeing, we think there are three things there. Well, we can see there aren't. Because why? Because I is the name given to the combination of body and mind. And so you pointed out two pieces of, of the eye, the ear and the nose. So the ear and the nose are pieces of the whole eye. So you can't, so therefore there can't be an eye that's separate from those because body, ear and eye are parts of the eye. But we think there's another piece that is called eye, as my friend Pende says, walking hand in hand with the ear and the eye, this eye, ear and nose better, yeah. So, yeah, so, the, the, so the, the, the implication of this is, these three are, are independent. So if I fell dead, the cup still works. It doesn't depend for its existence. It doesn't depend for its function upon the existence of Rabina. That's how we're talking dependent arising here. Same with the book. Now, the ear and the nose, so again, ear, you could say ear and nose are separate. Ear goes deaf, nose can still breathe. Nose stops breathing, ear can still hear. So in a simple sense, they are different phenomena and they function differently and their function is not impeded by the existence or non-existence of this one. So they're not dependent in that sense. Now, now, if there were a separate piece called I in here, like we think there is, when Chrissy says, oh, I can't stand your nose, Rabina, how dare Chrissy insult me? Well, you know, she didn't. Please hear this, it sounds silly. She insulted the nose. So if there were a piece in here called I, it's sitting there relieved. Oh, phew, I'm glad Chrissy didn't insult me. Poor old nose just got insulted. Just like the cup, if it breaks, the book is sitting there relieved. It didn't get knocked down. I mean, it's a joke, but it's true. But it sounds silly to us because we can't get it. What do you mean? Of course there's an I, but we can't pinpoint it. So if it were there and independent and separate, you have to be able to find it. This is the point about now, the parts. So person is made of parts. This is reasonable. So you do your IKEA job, then you put together, so the IKEA, we know they do a good job. They don't leave one leg out of the table. They don't give you five legs instead of four. They tell you they've made the table and then put the bits in. So they've made a rabina. Here the same point. Each piece must be millions, isn't it? Every tiny one of those pieces, like the pieces of a table, has to have a proper function. They're not just randomly chosen. They all together... Each thing, there's one thumb, there's one index finger, each of the ligaments, each of the nerves, each of the bones, each of the bits, all the pieces, bits and pieces, each of the pieces of mind, each of the pieces of, are all working together to function as Rabina. So if she's a psycho, then all the anger bits and the jealous bits are there working, doing their job of being a psycho, you know. So generally speaking, the I is the name given to this bunch of pieces. So you're going through, you're putting all pieces together, you're putting the pieces together, each piece does its job. You've finally got the entire pieces all together. There's nothing left in Ikea, in the box. You've done them all. They've all built into Rabina. Now, this is the point. We are keep waiting as we're building the new piece, the Rabina. We're waiting to discover the special piece in a special lip Ziploc bag with special gold writing with shiny lights on it called I, as well as the nose and the ear and the left breast and the right this. And you won't find one because you know what? You don't need one. You don't need a special piece called I, which we think is there to run the show. We don't need one. And if you do ask the question, because if each piece has its job, and if you're doing a really rigorous description of a person, you'd have a list of, I mean, that's like you'd have a list of the parts of a table. And if you had to put a list of the parts of a computer and you could, because we're scientific and rigorous, and if you have to make a computer, you'd have a list of 4,000 pieces and each piece would go exactly where it fits. There'd be no piece left over because each piece has its job. 
because each piece you label it, define it, and give it a function. That proves the reality of something conventionally. So, what would be the job of this precious eye that's weeping because it's all left out? Oh, there's no job for me. What am I going to do? There doesn't need to be a little piece of eye. Sounds very funny, doesn't it? It's fact, it's logic. So that conclusion is I is the name, the label we put upon them, the whole bits. So therefore, the one conclusion is the I can't be the same as all the bits, because as many bits as there are is as many eyes as there are. That would be the logic of introduction, and that's absurd. And nor is the I a separate bit, which we just proved with IKEA. Because if it does have a job, the, the it wouldn't work without it. And the Buddha is saying when you do the, you know, he didn't do the IKEA one, he did the opposite one, pull the pieces apart. And you put the pieces down, all the pieces down, all the bits of the body, all the bits of the mind. You do an exercise in your mind until the, until yes, there is nothing left. Until yes, there is nothing left. But that's the point. That's not the real conclusion. That's not, oh, well, there's no I, I might as well kill myself. Because once you've done the analysis, the conclusion you'll come to isn't, oh, well, there's no I. E the, the conclusion is, oh, my God, I have just realized the absence of what I thought was there. That realization is the realization of emptiness, not, oh, there's nothing there. That's nihilism. And it's easy to mistake emptiness for that. So the, as I said before about the bank, when I look in the bank, I'll see zero. That's just, there's nothing there. When Amanda looks in the bank, she sees the zero, but instantaneously, what appears to her mind is the shocking object that she just cognized, which is the absence of her precious 5,000 pounds. That's not nothingness. The absence of my iPad on that table is not, oh, there's nothing on the table. The biggest mistake is thinking that emptiness means nothingness, which becomes nihilistic. Therefore, there's no benefit, no worth, might as well die. Who cares? Not like that at all. It's like a rich, the emptiness of an intrinsic eye is a rich, delicious phenomenon to realize. It's the absence of what you thought was there. The whole, as Lama Zopa says, the, the regular yogis have unbelievable fear when they discover that. The greatest yogis have incredible joy. But finally, they realize that what they thought has been there since the beginning of this time isn't there, could never be there, and has has never been there. And once you've got that non-conceptual direct realization, you've cut the root of samsara. You have more work to do, but you cannot go back up. You can't fall back after that. Like I said, you can even lose bodhicitta at certain stages. You, know? you cannot lose this. And because all the dramas of life are the consequence of ego grasping, all the suffering, all the rebirths, all the anger, all the depression, all the being killed, lied to, stolen from, murdered, raped, as all as a result of delusions and, and acting out the delusions, which are all the result of the assumption of an intrinsic eye. And intrinsic everything else. Independent I. An eye independent of causes, independent of parts, and finally independent of the name, the word, the thought, I. I mean, all these analysis that Lama Zopa gives us, you know, the Lamas do this, try to show this one. The simple example, it's so evident, in the simplest one, it's so evident. When you first learn the alphabet. And the teacher writes an A on the blackboard or the whiteboard these days, I suppose. <clears throat> it's got three, it's three lines, isn't it? Three lines like that and one across. So it's very simple. If there were an intrinsic A, if there were, an, an, this is the point, an A that's independent of the mind cognizing it. If there's, a, if there's an A that's independent of the label A, if there's an A independent of the thought A, if there's an A that's independent of the mind seeing it, then that A would be evident to anybody who sees it. Oh, well, there's A. Immediately you'd recognize it. You don't need to be told because it's, that's what it means existing from its own side. It's evident. It won't be because you won't know what it is. I mean, I, I don't speak Tibetan. I, I can't read Tibetan. I tried one time to squeeze my brain. Nothing happened. So I've got, you know, my wall. 
in my home, I've got this, a page from the Prajapitami Sutra. It's just like, it's, like, it's just, you know, don't be rude to the Dutch, double Dutch. They're very rude to the Dutch, aren't we? Double Dutch, Dutch treat, Dutch, Dutch courage. And what did the Dutch do? They made up, must be made up by the English, was it? Probably sounds like the English made up that, but they're, they're neighbors, you know. Anyway, it's like, I can't read it. I just go blank. I see shapes. I see shapes, meaning I can't see the meaning. I mean, if it were intrinsically those words, I'd be able to read Tibetan just like that. It's very simple. That's proving emptiness. It's very simple. So as Amazoba says, first you're told it's A. First you see the three lines. What's that, miss? Well, darling, that's called A. And you learn it. So then the second you hear it, and that's the point, the second you first hear A, you, you say... I agree that's A. You just bought into it. She told you it means that and you bought into it. I agree it's A. So it's obvious from the first second you say that you made it A. You agreed upon it that it's A. You imputed A. You called it A. You created A. You bought into it as A. But then we forget that we did that. And the next time we see it, oh, there's A. Forgetting that you created the damn thing. Mm -hmm. That's how we live our lives. Because we've got ego grasping. Everything we've ever seen and heard and tasted and touched and smelled for eons is just appearing to us as self-existent, like we don't realize, we call it that. And then it becomes that. So uh, when I, you know, we, we, and we, we have to, that's why we have to use examples like when I did Kung Fu, I didn't mind being punched. Yes, being punched is, a lay, is, a, is, is an example of a negative action, no argument. But straight away you see, because I didn't think I was being abused, I didn't feel abused. As Lama Zopa says, if you don't feel abused, where's the abuse? Which is pretty shocking for our world. That's why Sunny in prison, her nightmare of 17 years, you know, husband's brain burst into, into, into flames, children lost, family lost, wrongly accused of murder. She changed her labeling of the situation. She changed her name, she changed the names. She changed her identity. She changed the labels for them. Therefore, she didn't suffer. That's how we all know in the Mahi, we get to the Mahayana level. And at our practice is to see, you know, learn to like problems like we like ice cream, as Lama Zopa says. So in the very beginning stages of practice, you can't afford to think that. You just got to control your body and speech and don't go berserk. Then you start to work on your mind, you get a bit spacious and you start to see the suffering of attachment and aversion. Then you get to the compassion wing and you really get more spacious now. And then you want to learn to transform problems because it's the quickest way to get rid of the delusions because you want to benefit sentient beings because you're driven by compassion. So bodhisattvas love problems. So Lama Zopa, you know, I did it, it was coming out soon, I think. Of, you know, we wrote the um, obituary for Miche and I interviewed Bimal Roger. It was very, it was very, we know the story, but it was so direct, you know. Well, he had a stroke, 2011, right? As Roger said, he didn't, there was absolutely not a fraction of change in his behavior or, his, or his, the way he was. He was clear, relaxed, calm, stable, funny, compassionate, as if nothing had happened. He never once in all the months and years of, being, of having the stroke, he never once discussed it, never once in the hospital asked a single person what was going on, he never had any interest in doing his, um, his exercises. And as soon as he discovered all the sheets at the hospital would be laundered and by shared by everybody, he was so excited, he spent all his time saying mantras and blowing over all the sheets in the pillowcases to bless people. And then he's in the pool doing his hydrotherapy and he's kind of drowning up to his nose, all he's doing is saying mantras and blowing on the water to bless all the people, you know. He didn't change, he was still happy and content and never mentioned it ever once. So of course, initially in the hospital, I thought he's mad. They soon discovered he wasn't, you know. Because he's instantaneously, when anything bad happens, which is what we call suffering, because his mind is so trained. Not only did he not have attachment or aversion to it, as Roger, as Roger said, it was like his, his, like his compassion increased hugely. It was joyful. It's hard to hear that, you know. Why was he joyful? Not because he's stupid. Not because he's a masochist. It's because all the holy beings, whether they're Buddha or not, or just even pretending to become Buddha or whatever, or even on the way to become Buddha, the main obstacle to their being Buddha is the presence in their mind of delusions and attachment and aversion. So any opportunity they have to, to have an object of attachment or aversion come along, especially aversion, then it's delicious because it causes you to, you greet it and therefore you smash the aversion, you know. They talk about a Tisha. That is ugly cook 
was mean and ugly and angry. People were shocked. Why didn't you, you know, how come you can bear this cook? He said, if I didn't know, if, he, if, I, didn't, if I didn't have him, how would I know I could have had anger? So that's if we're really practicing at that level, everything is grist for our meal. And this is proving emptiness. Nothing has intrinsic nature. It's how you label it. You don't feel abused, then you where's the abuse? I mean, in my own simple example, first of all, the, um, the Kung Fu one, but even one time I got held up with a gun in New York. I use that story, example. You know, it was a gun. This bloke comes, gun between my breasts, give me your money. You know? I always told the story. It's a funny story, actually. My sister Jan and I had been kind of radical lefties in London, you know, and, and we'd um, really, I mean, this is in the late 60s and early 70s, really, I mean, full on, serious, 100% devoted, working for groups and things, and then Black Panther stuff and all that stuff, whatever. And the thing was, Jan for a while started, we, we started shoplifting. We'd go down, we sort of all this noble idea of stealing from the rich for the poor. I mean, so pathetic, really, but we believed in that for a while. So we'd go down Oxford Street and sort of go and do a few hundred pounds of stealing of shopping, you know, for, for, and send it all to Australia for my, our family, you know. Anyway, I gave it up because we thought it was ridiculous, but she got caught one time. Anyway, whatever I'm saying now, in 74, we were in, London, in New York, and um, we'd been to this Irish bar, and Jan, she left with her glass of wine. She still hadn't quite given up stealing, you know. She had a glass of wine with her, and we're walking home, Lower East Side, New York City. We didn't know it was the worst time for violence and gangsters. We had no idea. So in the middle of the night, 2 a.m., this dude comes out of nowhere and puts a gun between my breasts, you know. Give me your money, right? So this comedy, I can remember it as comedy, you know. Well, first of all, because I'm very aggressive and kind of bossy, bossy, really bossy. And how dare, I mean, how dare a person put a gun in my chest? Excuse me, mate. So I got angry with him. I, I debated, you know, I debate, you know. I, I, I remember he was this close to me. And first, in, instantly, I knew he was more scared than me. And then almost immediately, I started kind of bossing him, kind of like, argue, who do you think you are, I said. I tried to get logic. I said, you, we're just as poor as you. You give me your money. I was so hilarious for the poor bloke, you know. He just kept saying, give me your money, right? And so then, and then Janice got a glass of wine. And she kept saying, hey, hey, brother, have some wine. I don't want your wine, I want your money. I kept saying, give me your money. Come on, give me your money. And he couldn't, couldn't get over it. And sort of, also, English-sounding voices blow Americans' minds. You can't just put like the Queen of England in front of you. You don't know what to do, you know. Anyway, in the end, he just gave up and walked away. So my, ex my experience in that story is because I didn't, I realized even then, I was like, well before Buddhism, that when there's no fear, there's no suffering. So it was my party story. He had probably more stress than I did after it. Do you understand? His knickers would have been in a knot for sure. Do you understand my point? It's an incredible example. I didn't have any trauma, neurosis, counseling, mental breakdown, you know, IDHD or whatever. Excuse me, whichever one. I'm, I'm joking. You get my point? Because I, just, I dealt with it. Whatever reason, my weird personality, you know. It's a, such a good example. Do you understand? I get a bit dangerous. I could have died, but I didn't. But there was no fear because I was the boss. I found that such a powerful experience, you know. So there's no trauma. Therefore, there's no suffering. Therefore, there's no abuse. That's the logic. And of course, it's, we hear it. We know these stories. And we always hear about, especially old wacky ladies who beat, beat gunmen on the head with their umbrella, you know. We laugh at those stories, but they're very powerful. You understand? A friend of mine, in her, she was in the bathtub, obviously naked, because she was listening to in the bathtub, and she thought it was her friend coming in the front door. She hopped out of the bathroom. It was a stranger with a, with a, a stick or something. And she started screaming at him and running towards him. Of course, she, he ran like hell. This maniac naked woman yelling at him. It scared the life out of him. Do you understand? So if you, if you take control and you're the boss, the other person, like two dogs fighting, you know, and the one that becomes the boss, the other one shrinks down, isn't it? That's how we are with each other. Power struggle, you know. So you take the power, the person becomes a victim. Okay, it's dangerous if they've got a gun, I agree. Just giving the example is what I'm saying. We have to train like that. And it's, and you, in other words, label it differently, is what we're really saying. Label it differently. And this is about emptiness. It's just the habits of ego grasping, which brings fear when, it's, when I is attacked, are so primordial. And that's why in scientific findings like Mr. Darwin, everywhere they turn, humans and animals all display the same response. When you're attacked, you freak out. So we assume it's a valid past of a valid person that you need. Buddha says, don't be ridiculous. You don't need fear to know what the hell to do. You need intelligence. Lama Zobu didn't have fear. He didn't sink to the ground like a stone. He used his intelligence and managed to survive, you know. So what that indicates is it's not necessary to have delusions, whereas in our views, delusions are an equal part, a valid part of a valid person. So again, Buddha's view is quite shocking. We can analyze it and look at it carefully.
clear that one of child solving problems is compassion, but mainly it's emptiness. Lama Zopa's experience, compassion, mainly compassion, but emptiness has to be there too. And that's why that always even more outrageous story is the same idea. There's, I never forget Kirti Senchan Rinpoche saying this, that for some level body sattva, I don't know what stage of development, but let's assume he's realized emptiness. Let's assume we've got incredible levels of love and compassion. He said, for that body sattva, the action of cutting off his hand and feeding it to a starving animal as is, in, is, is as inconsequential as a leaf, a leaf falling off a tree. So what's going on? First, he's got a body, so he's not stupid. Excuse me, I forgot my singlet this morning. Do we call it singlet in England? We only call it singlet in Australia, don't we? We call it, that's in English, isn't it? In singlet, right? Yes. What do you call this undervest thing? A vest. We still call it a singlet. Anyway, I forgot my singlet this morning, so I've got to keep watching. Sorry. <laughs> okay, excuse me. What was I saying? Oh, what was I saying? What was that one? Which one? Oh, the, oh, yeah, that one. Gosh, yes. Okay, so what's happening? Well, he's not stupid. He's just got a body and his nerves haven't died. So he's not stupid. He does definitely feel unpleasant feelings. Do you understand? There is a feeling, logically, called very unpleasant. It would be that. Extremely suffering feeling, right? There's no argument. But because he's got realized emptiness, because there's no longer ego grasping, therefore because there's no attachment and aversion, and because there is, as Lama Zoba says, unbearable compassion, he's only focused on the suffering of the animal, 100 billion percent, like a mother on the suffering of her child. So whatever's happening here is as if it's a leap falling off a tree. That's the way it is. Because we assume, because the body feels pain, there has to be anger and panic. But that's only because we've got ego, you see. The mind is a powerful thing. I, mean, I remember seeing a video years ago about what mothers do in dire circumstances to save their babies, you know? Of course, it's driven by attachment, but it's, it's, it's an interesting point. There's one woman <coughs> who lifted a car on her own to save her baby, you know? There's one woman who ran into a burning house. You think about that. She's got attachment to her baby, but the compassion is so tremendous that she forgets all about herself. Herself has gone into the background there, hasn't it? And she, she has no interest in the fire, no interest in the burning fire. All she can think of is her baby. Well, body are like that all the time for everybody. It's not just a random event, you know? That's because of emptiness, as much as compassion, both. <coughs> so Lama Zopa, no change. And, um, and he said, like, for example, with Rinpoche, when he first took on the job of being his attendant, he didn't know what his job meant. He didn't know what the job meant. He didn't know what the job entailed, you know, to be an attendant to a Lama. <coughs> so he thought he'd take Lama Zopa's lead, knowing what to do. Well, and Lama Zopa would express his needs. Well, he didn't. There was no concept of any needs. So Roger was utterly, I mean, overwhelmed by it because he tried to do whatever she wanted. So, you know, a person, I mean, even mentioned, I've always heard this story, one lady came in the window at three in the morning to Rinpoche's place, you know. So he welcomes her in, has a little talk. He's not worried. Whoever wanted to talk, they'd go in. He, didn't, he would never eat if he didn't give him a meal. He wouldn't have a cup of tea if he didn't give him a cup of tea. He never expressed a need. They say that's one of the criteria of being a, a bodhisattva, even lowest level. There's no longer the thought of I. There's no longer the thought of wanting something for yourself. That, again, is like mental illness for us, because we just assume if we didn't have that, we'd die. Because they made this paradigm shift in their mind of others being in their mind. So he didn't have needs. So there's Roger, Roger valiantly trying to kind of support this insane lifestyle, you know. At going to centres, he said, 24 hours a day. One centre to the next, the airline to the airport, to the centre. 24 hours a day. You know, non-stop working, non-stop interviews, non-stop people, lunch at midnight, no, and Rinpoche never slept anyway. Because there's no longer the thought of I. Only the wish to help others. That's bodhicitta. That's not just from emptiness. That's from bodhicitta. Mixed with emptiness. So therefore, this is the other thing too, no, no, we have to know the definition of suffering. This is why it's so important to understand the state of mind called feeling, this mental factor in the third category, which I call the mechanics. 
It's not in the category of delusions and it's not in the category of virtues. It's these mechanical bits without which you wouldn't function. So there's these various fundamental bits and pieces of the mind, like intention, attention, concentration, good memory, <coughs> feeling. They're just the way the mind is. They're not virtue or non-virtue and they enable us to function. But feeling is the most fundamental because every living being having a mind connected to a physical energy, there's physical sense, there's feeling, pleasant or unpleasant, forget the neutral, pleasant or unpleasant. And this attachment to only pleasant feelings, which is happiness, joy, ecstasy, bliss, you name it, <laughs> including having, including external in environments that trigger pleasant feelings. All this is the way karma ripens. Because we're, you know, we only, as the, as, as the Buddha says, we only, everybody only wants happiness, only doesn't want unhappiness. So that's the basis really for wanting to be able to practice things. We all want it. So what drives it though is attachment and the misconception of attachment that pleasant feelings can only be gotten by having the object of attachment, which is what samsara is in this gross world. We have a body of the five senses and the world consists of the five sense objects. And contact with some triggers pleasant feelings and contact with others triggers unpleasant feelings. We know this. So we spend our lives manipulating the outside world to get it to be just so. Because that's the only way we know how to get pleasant feelings. We know that. That's samsara. So why is that a problem? Well, the first level of practice, as we know, is we avoid the unpleasant feelings. We, no, <coughs> sorry. We avoid, we avoid creating in the future unpleasant feelings. And what creates in the future unpleasant feelings? And what is the source of our present unpleasant feelings and unpleasant things, meaning suffering, is harming others. So the very first level of practice is stop harming others. What Buddha is really saying is stop creating your own future suffering. That's the first level. And if you just did that level of practice, you'd wake up in another life with a nice human body. If you lived in vows of not killing, not stealing, and so on, you'd wake up in a good human birth with nice mummy, nice daddy, nice friends, nice siblings. People love you, give you credit, you'd be everything would be lovely. You'd have a lovely life, which is what we want, bare minimum. Because karma ripens in four ways. One, the type of rebirth, you'd have a lovely rebirth. One, two, you'd have good tendencies because you've lived in vows of not harming. You'd have no thought to kill, no thought to steal, no thought to lie. You'd be practiced in virtue. Three, you'd have no bad things happen to you. People will like you, be nice to you, don't kill you, don't steal from you, don't rape you, will give you credit in the bank. All the lovely things we want would happen. Why? Because they're the fruit of virtue. They're the fruit of non-harming, bare minimum, non-harming. And four, even the physical environment would be nice. Food will nourish you, air will nourish you, you won't get sick, you live a long life. Who doesn't want that? Bare minimum. The cause of that, at least live in vows of non-harming, at least stop harming sentient beings, and then purify every day, and then rely upon the Buddha and have a practice. How divine. Now you go to the next level, and we get to the more subtle level of suffering, and this is the powerful one that we just don't understand unless we analyze it, break it down. So let's do that, just roughly. Called the suffering of change. And all it means is, so the first level of suffering, the suffering of suffering, we all get that one. It's when the bad things happen. And we all know that. We, that's the only one we understand. The next one, Buddha calls it the suffering of change. And what's shocking is it's what we call happiness. So the first lot is when the bad things happen, you don't get what attachment wants. The second lot is when the good things happen and you get what attachment wants. And that's what we call happiness and that's our goal. So it's shocking to hear Buddha say, sorry guys, it's a more subtle, more nuanced, deeper level of suffering. Why? And this is the point. Why? Because it doesn't last. Now, kind of, we know that from our lives. Even though we desperately want happiness to last, we can't last. We kind of know it doesn't. So we could be surprised. What do you mean it doesn't last? We know that. It's more than that. It's more than that. And this is the tragedy of it. <coughs> so, okay. This is, an, this is using an example of a person who isn't just attached to cake and, you know, comfort, but is a person also attached to harming others, which is why, from, from the killing, for example. So there's always this example of this little fisherman, little boy, I mean, little boy, his mother, he, it's a story about the person I met who'd spent his life fishing. <clears throat> so anyway, there he was, he'd been in the lower realms in the past from killing, completed the main karma, exhausted the karma, and then eventually, like a miracle, got a human life. So there he is born, this nice, so the first type of karma he got was a nice human body. Second, he had really nice tendencies. 
good, nice qualities. He was kind, he was generous, but he had a particular tendency <coughs> to kill if you had him purified. Third, he had nice experiences similar to the course, a nice family, people enjoyed him, he was, had a good life, nice things happened, and a really nice environment. So all the good results of lots of vir virtue and merit. But the tragedy is, because he hadn't lived in vows of not killing, indeed, or not stealing or not lying or whatever, because he hadn't lived in the vows, in his case, of not, of not killing, he just only exhausted the killing from being in the lower realms. But then next life gets a human body from some virtue, but the three other residual results, this is the tragedy of samsara, the three other residual results of karma, the tendency to keep doing it, the experience of having it done to you, and an environmental result of it, they haven't been purified. So look at human planet. Seven billion human bodies, each of them had a non-killing karmic seed trigger at the time of their past death. But look at the rest of the three. People born with psychotic minds, rage, anger, despair, jealousy, killing, stealing, lying, because they haven't purified all aspects of the negativity. Second, the third in this, the second, the third, the, the third, but the second in this life, look at experiences of humans, which is the third type, this kind of karma called experiences similar to the cause. Look at the humans who are lied to, stolen from, murdered, raped, harmed, tortured, not believed, cheated on. Look at the suffering of human beings at the hands of others. That's experiences similar to the cause. So in terms of killing, and the third result, environmental, Look at the environmental suffering. From, so give an example of killing. This fisherman, he got a human body. He'd been in the lower realms. That's what he used that. And then it exhausted it, the main result. So he got a human body. But he hadn't purified all aspects by living in vows and by purifying. This is why the crucial first level of practice in the first scope is to live in vows and to purify. You've got to get ahead of the game. Without this, you can't get ahead. Just being good is not enough in the sense sense. So there's this lovely boy. And then he, he met fishing. Some introduced him to fishing. This is a tiny kid. And this is what happens. So this is the 12 links. You know, the, the, the fifth one or sixth one is called contact. So due to past karma, he, he's, he makes contact with the object called fishing. Something like that. The millisecond next one is then feeling. And in his case, very, very, very pleasant feelings. And why? The intensity of his pleasant feelings automatically on contact with fishing is equal to his habit of killing in the past. I remember reading about an Australian journalist. Was, um, he was maybe older people will remember. He was the, he was the arts writer, Robert Hughes. He's the arts writer for, you know, for like that American magazine, Time magazine for like 40 years. He's well known. He wrote many, many books. He talked about how when he first went trout fishing, it was a cosmic experience. So all he's saying is he experienced, he made contact with fishing his first time, and then it triggered unbelievably blissful experiences. He didn't know why, he assumed it was the fishing, but that's because of, that's the intensity of his habit of from past killing, so much so that the feelings were unbelievably joyful. That's so why when people torture, they experience orgasmic pleasure because they've got the habit to torture. So the amount of pleasure you, that arises, the next link after contact is spontaneous, equal to the amount of your karma. This is a tragedy. So then the next millisecond, craving kicks in, which is attachment. All this happens in a millionth of a second. So first contact with fishing. He's no idea about all this. Second, incredibly pleasant feelings. Next, unbelievably delicious attachment kicks in. And what attachment does is exaggerate the beauty and deliciousness of this entire event. So it appears wonderful to him. So what do you think? We only want pleasant feelings, right? He just got very pleasant feelings. So logically, logically, obviously, he would deduce that fishing caused it. This is how we perpetuate samsara. We just have eat cake. Look at our problem, just eating cake. We assume cake is the cause of the pleasant feeling. Now, the point is, it's, a, it, it's not. That's the point the Buddha's making. Cake or fishing or torturing, whatever habit you've got, which triggers pleasant feelings upon contact, those pleasant feelings, actually, this is the worst tragedy. Pleasant, okay, go right back to basics. Buddha's telling us that happiness, which means happy feelings and happy experiences, happiness is the fruit of past virtuous actions. So every millisecond you have a pleasant feeling, 
whether it's triggered by, you know, your virtue, which is a marvelous way to have a pleasant feeling out of your practicing of virtue, or triggered by torturing somebody, depending on your habit, look at the world. That pleasant feeling, its main cause is a virtuous action you, you did in the past that has dropped seeds into your virtuous, virtuous karmic seeds bank vault, and then upon contact, in this case of torturing, killing fish, it triggers it. So you get a pleasant feeling. But we think the fishing causes it. We think the cake causes it. We think the, the praise causes it. We think the, the sex causes it. No, it's a secondary cause. It's a secondary. It's a trigger. So the actual cause of a moment of pleasure is past virtue. The actual cause of a moment of unpleasure, of displeasure, of unpleasant feelings is a, is a result of a non-virtue. That's the simplest level of karma you can find. So how tragic. Even with eating cake. Not killing fish. At least the first level is don't, at least don't harm others. That's the worst karma. You get the worst suffering to you. But even just eating our cake, it's evident to us the cake looks divine, attachments in the mind, you're emotionally hungry, you're missing something. Oh, cake will do it. It looks divine. Of course you believe it's divine, as you see from its own side. And then you put it in the mouth, and this is the point. It does trigger pleasant feelings. It does trigger pleasant feelings. It does trigger pleasant feelings. Now the Buddhist, that's why he's calling it the suffering of change. So what happens? As you get that pleasant feeling, which you've been anticipating, building up, all excited, all excited, waiting for it to come, and it finally comes, and the first mouthful is the best pleasant feeling you'll get, but we don't, we don't, we're not happy though. At that, at that millisecond, the pleasant feeling arises upon contact with cake, same thing, contact, pleasant feeling, and then, and then attachments right there next to pleasant feeling, and it's saying, I'm not satisfied with that pleasure, eat more. Believing it'll be best next time. And we all know what happens, Four pieces later, you want to vomit. We know that. The, sad, the tragedy is present, is, is hunger, is greed, is attachment, is frantic, junky. We should be compassionate for ourselves, not, not be depressed, not get guilty. Attachment is, you see, attachment's never satisfied. So all the build up, first of all, you feel like you haven't got enough, yet emotionally hungry. Then you think, oh, cake will do it. So you anticipate, get all excited, get it, go there, wait for it. There it is, put it in the mouth. Attachment's still not satisfied. So you have to put it in again. Frantically hoping the second mouthful will give you the pleasure you want, that you'll be satisfied with. No good. Won't happen. Do it again. And then slowly, slowly, we know that inexorably, the pleasant feelings that began with the first mouthful are gradually diminishing. But here we are frantically trying to, trying to waiting for more pleasure to come, but we're not noticing it's, it's going down. And eventually it, tra it changes into very disgusting, unpleasant feelings. This is samsara. So with the long story, the long picture of it, with the fisherman, forget the cheek, you know, the, the fisherman one, especially that one, he gets his pleasant feelings, pleasure. And there's nothing wrong with pleasure, but look what triggers it. And then because of that, attachment then comes, and then because it, and then attachment grasps at it, holds on to it, so that poisons. So the, the, the happy feeling was from virtue, but now the attachment destroys it, and then he continues to kill fish, and so that creates negative seeds in his mind, and next time, straight to the lower realms. I mean, it's very tragic, sentient beings, how we cause ourselves suffering. The woman, the mother, I always talk the story. She was in Copan, and she said, well, where's my son being reborn? She cried. She'd heard the teachings from Lama Zopa. He died five years before from scuba diving. He spent his life a fisherman. Well, I said, I don't know, but ask Bishnama Kontrov. So she went to see him and he said, ah, yes, he said. First he was born in the hell, in the animal realm and now he's in the hell realm. And because um, she said, what will I, oh, she, she, oh no, what will I do for him? And Bishnama Kontrov sort of smiled sadly and said, what do you mean for him? For everybody. She, I met her years later, she's not a Buddhist. She found that very moving. So this is the point. He, so when we following ordinary attachments, get killing and harming others. This is why at least we stop doing that. Because attachment drives everything. And why? It's obvious. Because if you've done it in the past, when you do it again, it gives you even more pleasure. So we're, we're, this, is what, this is what paralyzes in samsara. And because we're junkies for happiness, we think, oh, wow, I found the cause of happiness, killing fish. And because we live in a world that doesn't criticize it. I mean, if he wanted to kill poodles, he'd be in trouble. He'd do it in secret, wouldn't he? Because the world would disapprove of him. 
the petitioning law approved. So the worst tragedy also, <clears throat> that right now the tragedy that increases the sadness of it all, is that when you follow attachment, because attachment paints a delicious picture, attachment, attachment makes up its own story that looks delicious to you, which means he could never see the suffering fish. He's a very intelligent person. His mum went fishing with him one time. She never liked to say anything. She didn't like fishing. So because she had no tendency to kill, she could see nakedly that these little beings weren't happy. They don't have a voice. They don't have limbs. The best they can do is wriggle their body, expressing their wish to be in the water, please. You know? Do you understand? When we follow attachment, we're blind because it attaches painted the picture that we project onto the thing, the person. That's how we harm other people. But it, it's got under the guise of being kind. So attachment is so tricky, you know. Violence is evidence. Anger is evidence. Attachment is very tricky. But it blinds us. Can't see what we're doing to others. You know? Can't see the suffering we're causing. Therefore, we can't see our own suffering. We're blinded by the pleasant feelings <clears throat> and blinded by the attachment. You know? This is samsara. So we have to become conscious. That's the point. Did you put your hand up? Yeah. Go on. Tony, yeah. We have to become conscious, that's all. To, to a degree of subtlety like this, it has to go very deep, you know. Yeah. Yeah, just unpacking what you're saying about um, feelings and, and contact. Um, so earlier you said um, feelings are, are, are neutral. They're neither virtuous nor non-virtuous, yeah. Okay, in that, in They're that very respect, intense yeah. and very powerful, yeah. Um, but then, so... <clears throat> So they're neither virtuous nor non-virtuous, but yet you get pleasant feelings. And um, the, the main cause of pleasant feelings is a previous virtuous That's action. exactly right. Yeah, I know. So, so that's it's totally awful to think that it's triggered by doing something negative, isn't it? That's the point. So that's, I that's, know. that's, that's it's very that's hard to hear, yeah. isn't it? So how... I know, exactly. I don't understand. Okay. It just seems to be the mechanics of doing something that often. Yeah. I think, okay, how I think it has to be because you've been attached to it. And attachment makes a pretty picture. So you keep going towards it and it programs you with attachment and that blinds you from seeing it. Because pleasant feelings are just the natural thing that arises <clears throat> when you do something you're habituated, even though it's negative. I know. So it has to be to do with attachment. I agree with you. It's so weird. It's so shocking that I like that fisherman who got cosmic experience or the torturer. I remember this fellow in America, BTK, who spent 35 years binding, torturing, and killing people. He probably killed 35, 40 people. He had a whole dungeon all set up. And he was, and he would kidnap people, bind them, torture them, get his, he called it orgasms, and then kill them because of the intensity of past. Uh, so it's hard to hear how, it feels somehow wrong, as if somebody organized it that way, but there's somehow that's how it works. I agree, it's fascinating that it's, um, I think about exactly the same thing. So you got your stock, you got your stock of virtuous karmic seeds from some past life, billions of them. So it has to be the attachment component, Tony, that when you're attracted to something, and I, I, I find it puzzling as well, that happy feelings can be triggered from doing harmful things, but it's because it's the habit. But even when it comes to attachment, even not even that, because the way Lama Zoba talks about attachment at quite a subtle level is that it's all, even what we call pleasant feelings is also in the nature of suffering. It's not just it leads to grosser suffering. It's also in the nature of suffering, which demands much subtler, much subtler analysis, you know. So I know it's fascinating. I agree with you. I totally agree. This is the tragedy of samsara. And because we're junkies of pleasant feelings, we're sitting ducks, you know. We just follow attachment and believe it. That's the tragedy. That's why to give it up is pretty intense. That's why we've got to be protected ourselves. And that's why Lama Zoba never stops teaching us on the Mahayana path that we can somehow, we can mitigate attachment by adding bodhicitta to the mix, you know. And we'll discuss that. Yeah, go on. Is it lunchtime yet? Um, what is the time? Yeah. Okay, what bit? Yeah, go yeah. on. Go Jennifer's just got a question that Good she had down. earlier. Go, darling, talk to me. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've got a question from before the break uh, about the mindfulness fish. Yes. So the mindfulness fish is part of the mind looking at another part of the mind. I just want to clarify that. That's exactly right, yeah. Yeah, so is the mindful fish like the awareness, the consciousness, looking at the thoughts? No, it's a very precise part. There are, we can all agree, aren't there, if we think of it, there are hundreds of pieces of the mind, aren't there? Would you agree? 
hundreds of different thoughts, aren't there? Would you agree with that? Yes. So we can see too, even without technically analysing it, we, we have got the, we all can see we have got the ability for self-reflection. We can see that. We have got that, haven't we? Mm -hmm. so we can already see that one part of the mind can observe another part of the mind, isn't it? So that's all yeah. it is. So the mind, so your, your concentration is constantly on the clarity of your mind. That never wavers. So out of the corner of your eye, as Lama Yeshi calls it, the mindfulness fish, but as Panchen Lama calls it, this subtle awareness. It's a subtle, which implies to really do it properly, it has to be subtle. It's a subtle kind of wisdom, a subtle kind of awareness that's observing, checking, watching for the eye to be evident to us. So yes, it's one part of the mind, absolutely. Great, thank you. There's no other choice. Oh, the mind is, it's not the body. It's only the mind and the body. There can't be anything else. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Good, darling. Thank you. What else do we have? Before lunch. Yeah, there's a question as well. Good, darling. Who is it? Where? Question or is it in here? What's the question? I have a question. Who has got a question? David. Oh, good, David. Talk to me, sweetheart. Hello, Rubina. Yeah. Um, I try, I'm not sure whether I can express it because it is in meditation and um, I sort of can feel the solid eye in my myself and this subtle watching is always with a commentary. I don't have the fee. I can't um, just non-conceptually feel it. Um, I That's so maybe I'm, it's just yeah. sorry well, maybe is it just the process that i'm because basically i obviously i have not reached chamata uh, so is it just keep going and um accept the commentary of the watcher oh there is the thought and here it comes another thought and no, oh i feel okay. my okay okay yeah? there's different things it seems right that's why we've got to start we've got to constantly focus our, our, aware, our attention yeah. on something. So here we're mm -hmm. choosing to pay attention to whatever's flowing on in the mind. So mm -hmm. at this point, forget about the mindfulness fish yet. Just mm -hmm. this point alone, do you understand the job is to pay attention to whatever pops up in your mind? And mm -hmm. there is to be not conceptual, no commentary. Try not to comment. Try not to get involved in the thought. Try not to judge. Just try to watch the thoughts. That's the first step. So if we practice that often enough and get trained in not having conceptual, not involved, you have conceptual thoughts, you can't see. Help. There's a difference between have the conceptual thoughts flying through your mind and there's a difference between that and engaging in the conceptual mm. thoughts. So you mm. just watch. So when that is steady enough that the thoughts have a little bit calmed down and that's what they begin to say is the clarity of your mind, which is mm. quite subtle, then you can bring out this little mindfulness fish. Then you can bring out mm. this little subtle wisdom that just without disturbing the concentration can just check things out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but where's the mistake? I, but the, I don't know. I I think um, my watching, um, whatever who is watching, watching your thoughts. Uh, you mean watching yeah, your mind? No, yeah. no. The the sort of the the just paying attention. There's the always a comment comment the mind, with it David. to the mind, David. Watching yeah. the mind. That's the job. Yeah. Are you doing? Are you saying you're doing that? Well, when I'm trying, I still have the comment about watching it. Am I there? Am I watching? Is okay. this okay. correct? So that's okay. So you're, you, you know, in the beginning, you have to have that. That's adjusting. You've got okay. to do that. It's like when you first drive the car, you can't do it spontaneously. You've got to be adjusting yourself all the time. So in, in, in concentration meditation, when you go through the nine stages, that's exactly what you're doing. You're going to be watching like okay. a hawk. And you've got to adjust if you're too sleepy, adjust it if you're too busy. Of course, you have to do that. Okay. You, you, that has to be there. Otherwise, you'll fall asleep or you'll go crazy. And yeah, because it's better okay. as it, the, the attention just stays on the mind. That's quite advanced, sweetheart. Okay, so so just keep practicing and accepting the thoughts about the watching. No, and no, then... no, 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 no. Don't just you acting as if they're they're un, they've got to be conscious thoughts that you're having. So you're adjusting yeah. the meditation. They're not. Listen, thoughts are going to come no matter what because our mind is uncontrolled. 
Yeah. So when you're watching the mind, you're watching all the thoughts that are coming. Yeah. But then you, I, now you just leave, you just watch those thoughts, not engage in them. Then yeah. the other one is you're going to be having adjusting. You must adjust. Yeah. You're not concentrated yet. So you've got to, you've got to have the commentary there that's conscious. Mm -hmm. adjusting your concentration don't yeah. be sleepy david you, you have to be quietly there otherwise you just become mindless but as you get better concentration mm -hmm. that gets calmer and calmer okay okay thank you do you understand yeah yeah i hope i think that's about right okay yeah yeah right, david, thank you keep trying okay well, something else time for lunch so listen what's happening today is that um people over the different times ask what to do, ask me if they'd like to, if they can take refuge. And I, I'm being given permission by Lama Zopa Rinpoche, but I only want to do it, now with Zoom, it's a whole different world, but I only want to ever do it in the framework of one of my, one of Lama Zopa's centers. So I wait until an opportunity arises in a center. So it's come this week because somebody's asked to take refuge. Is that right, Christine? That's correct, right? Somebody has, I'm just explaining we're about to do refuge this afternoon because people have asked me and I wait for the opportunity for one of Lama Zopa's centers to offer the opportunity. Then I'm, I wouldn't just do it on the side. So there's about 17 people who want to join us this afternoon. So we're going to have refuge because one person here wants, right? Okay. So we'll stop the teachings. We'll finish. And we've had enough, I think. We'll finish at about sort of three or maybe 10 to three. And then the people will all come on if they haven't come sooner, about these 17 people. And then we'll do the refuge ceremony. So anybody who wants to stay on for that, you're very welcome. But you don't have to. So we'll finish if you like. But then, but I see on your schedule, it says things like, you know, at the end and thanking and all that. So maybe, so maybe everyone can just stay if you want to. I mean, we'll probably finish around four anyway, which is the time we were scheduling, right? So we'll, so the last hour will be refuge. One thing, teachings about it, about the vows, and then take very short on online. Anybody, you know. Who wants to do that's very welcome so that's what i'm saying all right the last hour will be refuge and lay vows and you, and you don't have to stay here once you can go home of course you can that's all oh there goes water again it's a good sign purification don't worry <laughs> well you might as well think that why well, think they might be guilty you know oh purification i break another cup of purification you know so listen let's think about lunch as empty Think of a no inherent nature, it's not real peas and real yak, real this and bowl and real delicious food that's down there for the kind woman who makes the food. It's not real from its own side. Our mind is making it up. So it's newly labeled that. So within all that, we imagine it's <coughs> big as the universe, a delicious big skull in the sky. We bless it with Oma Hong, Oma Hong, Oma Hong, the blessing, the energy of enlightened body, speech, and mind, blessing it, delicious nectar. Then we have to offer it, as Lama Zopa says. And we think of all the suffering sentient beings, and then we think of all the holy beings. And then we think of all of them experiencing the bliss of receiving it. Think right now, that's it. Lama Sange Lama Chur, Deja Lama Gedonte, Kungi Depo Lama Che Lama Namla Chur Pabu. And then we think also we're eating it so we can be fat and healthy, so we can be a benefit to sentient beings. So just those 15 seconds of positive thoughts, this is the Mahayana approach, those 15 seconds of positive thoughts will go in next to the attachment thought, which is the usual reason we eat. And it, it completely mitigates the attachment. It lessens the attachment. It calms the attachment. It creates masses of virtue. Just those 15 seconds of thoughts, which is nothing I want to talk about later. It's like the easiest way to make the most of our ordinary daily life. You know, It's amazing. And then one time, as Lama Zopa said in Melbourne, once you've done that, then the bigger your stomach, the better. But please enjoy your lunch and discuss all this if you'd like. And come back at we'll come back early today. Come back at uh, two. Yeah, that'll do.